Number 10, knocker upper. All right, it sounds a little different than its actual purpose. Hear me out. Alarm clocks, they're not great, right? They suck, no doubt about it. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real life person. What does that look like? What does that sound like, rather? at 6 a.m. That person is called a knocker-upper, a person employed solely to wake up workers at mills and factories on those early morning shifts. Now, going from house to house, using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows, that sounds like the best job ever, right? I can't close the list with this one. This is number 10, for sure, it's kind of fun. If you had this job, well, you're probably not alive anymore. I don't know, unless you live in a weird town. The people at the time were a lot friendlier back then than they are now, so, you know, I'm sure the knocker upper came around today, It'd be a little different. They'd probably be on World Star the next day. Knocker uppers back in the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for waking me up. I would have lost $14. Thank you. It was a big deal. It was definitely a big deal. Number nine. The Linkerman. Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, if you were traveling alone at night, well, you'd probably get lost. Cause yeah, even London now I'd get lost, you know what I mean? So that's where a Linkerman would ideally come into play. They'd come in to save your night. What they would do is they would carry with them a torch to help guide your way home. They'd be like, hey, follow me, I know these streets, and then you do it, I guess? It's a little scary. At the end of this impromptu tour, they'd of course expect a little tip from you. Of course, of course, thank you for lighting my path and getting me home, cheers. Here's one nickel, it's actually a lot back then. Here's one penny, there we go. They weren't so bad, they were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to B, whilst also being able to see one foot in front of the other, that doesn't hurt, especially in Victorian London. You get to step on a dirty rat, that'll be gross. It's like a friend walking you home, only you don't know them, and it's the Victorian era, so probably pretty unsafe. 50-50 if you're gonna make it. And their charge was usually one farthing or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker man, like a lot of the jobs on this list was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from that era. And there were even a couple famous linker men, famous linker mans, like Lawrence Casey, for example, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Imagine that, your arm must be so strong with that lamp all day. Ooh, it's just like, oh, I can't put it down. Number eight, ghost photography. 1800s ghost photography. Apparently it was a theme or a, a vibe, I don't know, but there were people that would take the photos of these ghosts. So at one point you would be hired as a professional ghost photographer. On paper, here's your tax returns. That's what I did. The camera, of course, was a hot new invention back then. So tales of ghost and spirit were easily believed, especially when you have a photo of a see-through woman. That probably helps sell your tail for sure. Like, up oh, here she is. It's like, that's that's mom. That's definitely not, you just did that in the back room. That's, I don't believe you. A big name in the ghost game was that of William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849, so now he's for sure a ghost. Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister, and at the age of 22, he was appointed as editor of the Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. Yeah, this British medium, Richard Borsonal, featured a photo of W.T. Stead and a spirit. Imagine that, imagine a day where somebody was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and they also posed for photo ops with ghosts. Like, can we pick a lane, science or not? What are we doing here? Number seven, a phrenologist. I think if this YouTube thing doesn't work out for me, I'm gonna go and make up a science. It worked for phrenologists. They claimed that a person's personality, character traits, and abilities could all be figured out by bumps and indents on a person's skull. Characteristics like secretiveness, amativeness, conjugality and combativeness were apparently controlled by areas of the brain that they called organs of the brain. The idea was dismissed by the church, but it nonetheless gained traction through Europe and was really popular in the States. The idea that you could modify these organs through self-control and practice sounded really good to self-help gurus at the time, if only it was real. Number six, a dog whipper. Looking for someone who absolutely despises dogs and doesn't mind being despised by the rest of us otherwise known as a dog whipper. Back in the day, huntsmen would often hunt foxes and nail their tails to church doors, which would attract dogs of the streets. You'd also have churchgoers who would bring their dogs with them to church. These dogs were not allowed in though, so they'd all have to wait outside. You know how dogs are though. They didn't just sit there waiting patiently. I'm sure some good boys and girls did, but more often than not, they'd be playing and sometimes fighting, disrupting the church services. Enter the dog whipper, who was armed with tongs to grab a dog and remove it from the church grounds, and a whip that would be used on the loudest of the poor pooches. Number five. A rat catcher. I know this will make a few of you out there squirm in your seats. Rats in Victorian England were a massive problem. They were everywhere. Every nook and cranny of your house, from the basement to the pipes. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So of course, where there is a problem, 
there was a job. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era and were highly praised in society, but the job wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into the dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and catching and often killing thousands of rats a year. Often rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats too. I don't know though, gonna be me. Number four, an upright worker. Upright workers, otherwise known as chimney sweeps, actually started off being children as young as the age of four. The smaller size of the little kiddos was perfect for fitting inside and climbing up and down chimneys. The little suckers would rub their elbows and knees up against the brick of the chimney so much that they would be scraped raw before callousing. Isn't that lovely? No, no it's not. It's horrible. Some children were deliberately underfed to keep them small enough to do the job. Some of them would get permanent lung damage from the dust and smut and smoke from the chimney. Some kids even got stuck in the chimneys. Thank the Lord they eventually passed a law that would make it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to be a chimney sweep. But even then, tis not a profession many would like to have. Number three, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing in the Victorian era. They definitely existed, as the first one was invented in 1823, but it was not exactly a portable thing. So matches were your match. The first match was invented in 1805, but it sucked. The first friction activated match came about in 1826, and they were made with white phosphorus, which is extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was actually mainly done by teenage girls and in the worst of conditions too. Forget protective gear. Oh, you wanna take your lunch break away from the highly toxic white phosphorus? Oh, no, no, no. That's right, these girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would end up ingesting the white phosphorus. Mmm, yes, my favorite seasoning. Number two. Resurrectionists. Back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of the line. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around, which led to a good price for bodies that were in reasonably good condition, other than being deceased. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, as now you've created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves, becoming resurrectionists. A cool name for an absolutely god-awful profession, if you could call it that. The problem was bad enough that people would actually guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. No one should have to do that. Number one, Night Soil Man. All right, if you need me, I'll be depositing my night soil over in the toilet. Poop. Night soil is poop. And the Night Soil Man? Well, you see, before we had real sewer systems, the night soil you deposited at home would go into a lovely hole in the ground. As you can imagine, these would tend to fill up over time, and that's when you have your night soil men come in. Yes, his job was to clear out the poop deposits from houses and cart it away in the middle of the night so nobody in polite society would have to see it. But they were always in business, so that makes the job a little less crappy. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have the Tichborne case. This was quite a bizarre legal case that captivated Victorian England in the 1860s and 1870s. It involved a claimant named Arthur Orton, who alleged that he was the long lost heir to the Tichborne baronetcy. Despite numerous inconsistencies in his story, Arthur managed to convince some members of the Tichborne family and a significant portion of the public that he was who he claimed to be. The case went to trial in 1873 and it became a media sensation with thousands of people lining up outside the courthouse to catch a glimpse of the proceedings. This was basically like the Victorian era's OJ trial or the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial, you know? The people wanted to know. Despite Arthur's conviction for perjury, the case continued to fascinate the public for years to come and it became a symbol of the era's fascination with sensationalism and fraud. The Tichborne case remains one of the most infamous legal cases in British history and is a cautionary tale about the dangers of believing in something without sufficient evidence. In our number 9 spot today we have the London Beer Flood. This sounds like it would be quite a fun time, but it was anything but that and instead was a tragic event that occurred on October 17th, 1814 in the St. Giles District of London. At the Mew and Company Brewery, a massive vat containing over 135,000 gallons of beer suddenly ruptured, causing a wave of beer to flood the surrounding streets. 
the torrent of beer destroyed several nearby houses, killing eight people and injuring many others. The flood was so powerful that it even knocked down the wall of a nearby pub, trapping and killing some of the patrons inside. The London beer flood was caused by a combination of factors, including poor construction of the vat and overfilling it with beer. The brewery had a history of safety concerns, and many of the workers were aware of the dangers associated with working there. Despite this, the brewery continued to operate, and tragedy struck. The incident became the subject of much media attention at the time, and it continues to be remembered today as a tragic and bizarre event in London's history. The victims of the flood were commemorated with a plaque on the site of the former brewery, and the incident has been the subject of numerous articles, books, and even a stage play. Not sure the logistics of that one though. In our number eight spot today, we have the Victorian bicycle craze. This is a name to refer to a period of intense enthusiasm for bicycles that swept across Europe and North America in the late 19th century. The introduction of the safety bicycle with its chain driven mechanism and rubber tires made cycling a much more accessible activity for the general public. It became a popular mode of transportation and leisure activity, particularly among the middle and upper classes. The craze also had a significant impact on fashion, with women's clothing becoming more practical and comfortable to allow for cycling. It's funny to think of now because like, it's just a bike, but at the time it was so much more than that. It's like how smartphones completely changed our lives in more ways than we probably even know. That's basically what the bike was like in the Victorian era. The bicycle craze had a profound impact on society and culture at the time. It led to the development of new industries, such as cycling clubs, and it also paved the way for the modern transportation industry. The bicycle became a symbol of freedom and empowerment, particularly for women who were able to travel further and faster than ever before. The Victorian bicycle craze remains an important cultural and historical phenomenon that changed the way people lived, worked, and played. Number seven, borac borosic acid in milk. No one should cry over spilt milk unless it's been treated by borosic acid, and in that case, you'd be 100% allowed to cry, and your experiences are valid. In the 1800s, borosic acid was believed to purify milk, removing the sour taste and smell from milk that had gone off. In a casual remark in her widely popular 1861 book, Mrs. Beaton's Book of Household Management, mentioned one should use borosic acid in their milk. She told consumers that this was quite harmless in an addition, but she was wrong. Borosic acid purifying milk was responsible for getting a lot of people sick. Small amounts of borosic acid could cause nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and diarrhea, but worse, it was what borosic acid concealed that was particularly dangerous, and before pasteurization, milk was often contained a huge amount of bovine TB, or, you know, beef TB, tuberculosis, which would flourish in the bacteria-friendly environment created by the substance. Bovine TB damages the internal organs and the bones of the spine, leading to a severe spinal deformities. It is estimated that up to half a million young people had died from bovine TB from the milk in the Victorian period, which is why you should check your sources and not get everything from one source, like your mom telling you this random article that she found on Facebook. Number six, carbolic acid poisoning. Victorians linked cleanliness to godliness and respectability. The idea that it was next to godliness was very deeply ingrained. The new science of microbes only in testified the Victorian preoccupation with tackling germs which they now knew could lurk out of sight. Chemical cleaning products to eradicate dirt and diseases were heavily advertised and highly effective, but their active toxic ingredients like carbolic acid were contained in bottles and packages that were indistinguishable from other household products. Boxes of caustic soda and baking powder could be easily mistaken. In September 1888, it was reported in an article that 13 people had been poisoned by carbolic acid in one incident, and five died. And only in 1902 did the Pharmacy Act made it illegal for bottles of dangerous chemicals to be similar in the shape of ordinary liquids. So it took a couple of years, but still, at least now we wouldn't have issues identifying bottles from the other. But as cleaning products go, arsenic and citrus 9 were commonly used in Victorian cleaning products, which if some don't know, the immediate symptoms of acute arsenic poisoning includes vomiting, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. Those are followed by numbness, tingling of the extremities, and muscle cramping and death. But the Victorian era was also about fitting into their corsets, and a few illnesses wasn't necessarily seen as a bad thing. But either way, the era in itself wasn't unfamiliar with tragedies, as death lurked at every corner from either poisoning or TV. Number five, washing the hair. I have really long hair, and it does take a minute to maintain it, but thanks to modern technology and our hair products of the rooms, I don't have to worry that much about my hair. But in the Victorian era, women's hair were considered the crowning glory, and the longer, the healthier it is, the better. It would only be let down when she was alone with her husband, and so stayed in pins for the rest of the time. To keep it healthy, women didn't have to wash their hair nearly as often as we do today, taking this particular habit only a weekly or monthly schedule. According to research on the hair care part of the period that this was in, hygiene and beauty towards the end of the Victorian era 
area suggested that people with oily hair should only wash their hair every two weeks or so, and those with normal hair should wash it once a month. And since sources recommended washing the hair and scalp one or two times a week, the reason being is because soap would quickly dry off the scalp, leaving it very itchy and dry. And of course, this was an era where they didn't know much about chemicals and its horrible effects on the human body, and sometimes even used pure ammonia to clean the hair, which as you know, ammonia is a product used for cleaning hard surfaces like your stove or your sink. So it cleaning your scalp would be very bad. Still, I'm wondering how did they use ammonia if their hair didn't fall out? Probably either way, shampoo is still something that we use now as it was invented in 1927 as a liquid soap. Number four, bread alternated with alum. When basic staples like bread started to be produced cheaply and in large quantities for the new city dwellers, Victorian manufacturers seized the opportunity to maximize profit by switching ingredients for cheaper substitutes that would add weight and bulk. Bread was altered, adulterated with plaster of Paris, bean flour, chalk, and alum. Alum is an aluminum-based compound today used in detergent, but then it was used as bread back in the day because it was whiter and heavier. Not only did such adulteration lead to such problems as malnutrition, but alum produced bowel problems and constipation or chronic diarrhea, which was also often fatal for people. Number three, beauty. Those unlucky to be born with freckles were advised to rinse their faces with lemon juice or in more stubborn cases, rub the crap out of their skin with carbolic acid or sit in the sun until the freckles burnt off. And if premature wrinkles resulted from these harsh so-called cures, young women might be having the habits of their older relatives and drape their faces with thin slices of raw beef before bed. Sleeping with any animal fat on the skin, like fat, veal, lard, all that stuff, was thought to restore youthful suppleness and beauty. Looking fit and healthy is a very common shared narrative that has been defined and redefined multiple times throughout history. And when it came to the Victorian era, weight loss drugs was often permitted, and if anything, encouraged for both genders, but mainly ladies to maintain their figures in and out of corsets. Overweight women were instructed to drink their water with lemon, and if that didn't do the trick during the weight loss drugs, they would also uh, use ingredients like arsenic and Pain, believe it or not, tapeworm larvae. The skinny women didn't have an easy time either as they were also told to lie still as often as possible in dim light to avoid all anxiety endeavoring to feel indifferent to every sensation as one book had recommended. Weird. Number two, asbestos. Asbestos was the new wonder material of the Victorian era and was used in all manner of household objects as insulation for electrical appliances like toasters and hair dryers mixed into plaster and applied to walls and even some toys, which is actually still a problem that we're facing today. By the end of the 18th century, scientists have discovered many uses for asbestos, such as filters and for fire resistance. This paved the way for asbestos becoming a popular industrial materials by the mid 1800s. However, when commercial products of asbestos insulation began in 1879, the first case of an asbestos related a disease described as curious bodies in the lungs were detected in 1899. The first cases of asbestos and lung cancer are attributed to asbestos exposure, which was diagnosed in the United States. Symptoms can vary into severity, but in common okay note, some types of asbestos are cleared naturally by the lungs or broken down already in the lungs. But long-term effects of the exposure doesn't show up until 10 to 40 years later. There is no cure for asbestos once it has developed, and because it's not possible to reverse the damage to the lungs, meaning those who are exposed to asbestos for a long time had the consequences the longer they were exposed to it. Number one, arsenic. We all have our own favorite colors. Mine depends on my mood, but it's usually red or black. For the Victorians, it was notably obsessed with the color green, even to the point that shades of green was driving them nuts. For some reason, they placed in a nice shade of green wallpaper, and everyone at home was just getting sick from the young to the old. When a doctor in the 1860s noticed a spike of hospital visits, all the patients seemed to share the same idea of green wallpaper wrapped around their walls. The culprit was found in the dye used in the production of the paper, a vibrant green pigment containing a highly toxic metalloid arsenic. The killer, as it so often turns out, was inside the house, plastered on an every wall and beautifully decorated sheets. Wallpaper was killing people. While arsenic was known most as a rat poison in homes, the substance found its way in every other aspect of the daily life of the Victorian person. It could be found in household items such as food coloring, dresses and baby strollers, to makeup. When mixed with paint, arsenic created an alluring, pearlescent effect, most typically a brilliant shade of green, and so it became fashionable to wear laurels and flowers painted with the dye. Like poisonous lead before it, radioactive of radium after, dousing yourself in arsenic was a deadly fashion trend of the day. Chemists and governments were very well aware of the dangers of the element, but demanded that such miners pulled it out of the earth in volume nonetheless. In summary, it was a renowned designer and social activist named William Morris noted the poisonous substance and the new health regulations associated with it and decided to change it to non-toxic wallpaper. Number 10, oral care. When it comes to overall health care, your teeth should also be in that list. And for the Victorians, typically they'd only really go to the dentist when the damage is near its breaking point.
point. And because they didn't have any toothpaste that wasn't drenched in the multitude of poisons they thrived off on, people would brush their teeth using salt, typically putting salt on their fingers and then rubbing across their teeth. The toothbrush as we know today was invented in 1857, however, it wasn't until the nylon bristle toothbrushes of the 1930s came along that brushing one's teeth became more widespread. Salt is a natural disinfectant that helps with gum disease in a few ways. It removes loose debris and cleans the teeth and gums, but reduce inflammation and swelling and soothes the gums. It also gets rid of decay and plaque. Gum recessions can be caused by eating too much salt, and gums as part of the immune system may pull back to reveal a symptom of teeth making them more vulnerable and less resistant to tooth decay. So while it may look effective, it's actually temporarily removing surface stains. As for salt, the same holds true. Salt acts as a surface abrasive and can definitely make the teeth look whiter, but it can definitely damage your tooth enamel. And unfortunately, once your teeth is damaged, it's damaged for life. And it wasn't until the 1940s that the concept of brushing one's teeth would be considered a routine event. Number nine, bad bathrooms. The bathroom as we know it is a Victorian invention, but at first it could be a dangerous place. Besides horrible cases of scalding in the bathtub, there was even reports that there were incidents of lavatories spontaneously exploding. The reason this might be was due to the fact that flammable gases such as methane and hydrogen sulfide emanating from human waste built up in the sewers and then early toilets would leak back into the homes where they would theoretically be ignited by a naked flame of a candle. Wild stuff, but that did happen. And since showers were not invented yet, everyone did bathe to keep clean. Most people bathed in rather small small quantities of water in their bedrooms with a basin and pitcher of cold water. Poorer families would have to boil water on the stove and then add it to the cold water to a wooden or metal tub, usually in the kitchen area where it was time for a deep scrub down. Hands, face, and armpits and crotch were essentially regions that was not necessarily to be submerged in order to maintain cleanliness. Nicer homes not only had proper porcelain bathtubs, both hot and cold taps nearby, even some had the luxury of a luxurious foot bath, but these extravagant things were more for your feet. Number eight, flammable parking sign. Although it's a great invention as it helped many advance many parts of our modern civilizations of immense proportions, it still aggressively fills out our landfills and destroys thousands of ecosystems. But still, it's a very useful material, but of course not everything about it at first was beneficial to its beholder. A British inventor named Alexander Parkes, who invented the moldable material and was considered the first celluloid of a bulk material for forming objects as we call today, Plastic. He christened it as Parkinson, but it quickly became known as its American name of celluloid. The development of celluloid was particularly spurred by the desire to reduce reliance on ivory with its shortage caused by overhunting, and the inventor Alexander was never able to see his invention reach to full fruition after his firm went bankrupt due to scale up costs. Such early plastics were highly desirable because they allowed everything from brooches to hair combs to billiard balls, previously only available in expensive ivory, to be made cheaply. It was even used to make collars and cuffs that could be easily cleaned. Unfortunately, Parkinson is also very flammable as it degrades and can self-ignite and is explosive on impact. Weird. Number seven, grave designs. Graves, but make them cool, you know? Customize your own pit in the ground. That's fun, that's grim. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, pretty much anything floating around your mouth and eyes, it was spreading and it was bad. Not a good thing to ingest. Not an ideal time in history. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course, being gravely ill. But with this came a dark new fun trend. Yeah, here we go. The safety coffin. Yeah, let's uh, make your own coffin, DIY. These coffins, God forbid, you were buried alive while these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again. Yeah, some Tony Stark guy in the back's like, if you push this, the body will pop back out and come to life. It's like, really? A lot of these coffins were built with extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire, the safety backup wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground, and attached to a bell on the outside on the ground. So if somebody was walking by and they heard a bell ringing beside a gravestone, first of all, it's haunting, well, they know something's up and they can get them out. But folks would get creative with their safety coffins. They would ask the inventor to make them crazy things, like a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester. He had some odd requests. He passed away in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his coffin after he passed. The special door would reveal a layer of glass. Yeah, so if anybody saw any condensation, well, you know, he's still alive and get him out. Only he wasn't alive. And now we just have the world's scariest exhibit. Just a real life dead man. Let's close that back up forever. I don't want a glass coffin, that's disgusting. Number six, rat catcher. I mean, obviously you know what's gonna happen with the name the rat catcher. It's gonna make a lot of you out there squirm in your seats and I apologize in advance. Hit that thumbs up, you know, let's even out the energy. Rats in Victorian England, they were a massive problem. They were everywhere. Every nook and cranny of your home probably had a dirty, fat rat just sitting there with its weird teeth looking at you. From the basement to the pipes, everywhere. It was literally a, it was a big problem. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So imagine that. So of course, there's a problem. So of course, where there's a problem, there's now a job, right? Someone's gotta do something about it. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era. 
I mean of course, brave souls, and they were highly praised in society, but the job obviously wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and we'd catch them and you'd often have to kill thousands of rats every single year. And then deal with that. I don't even know how you deal with those bodies. Let's say bones, ew. More often than not, rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats, so. You have your own little animal posse hunting down other animals. You would feel pretty good. You'd feel like a, the king of animals almost. Probably not, eh? It's probably a disgusting job. You probably hate it every day. Number five, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing back in the Victorian era, obviously. I mean, they definitely existed. The first lighter was invented in 1823, but it wasn't like the ones we have now. Not like those Bix that still don't work. It wasn't a portable thing. The first match was invented in 1805, but it kind of sucked. And the first friction activated match came around much later in 1826. This one here changed the game for good. They were made with white phosphorus, which is of course extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was of course done by people, young women. It was only women that had to do this and in the worst of conditions, of course. And before you ask, no, they didn't understand protective gear. Well, it did a bit, but even so, women didn't get that kind of luxury, right? They didn't get that treatment. These girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would probably end up ingesting said white phosphorus. The entire shift. History is horrible. Number four. Resurrectionalist. All right, back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of their line, right? You're not gonna go dig up someone's wife and be like, hey, mind if I study her? He's like, no, please. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around to begin with, which led to a good price for bodies that were in, well, reasonably good condition to, you know, study up close, other than being, you know, deceased and disgusting. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, sure, I'll admit that. Now you've probably created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves. And that's exactly what happened. People would become their own resurrectionalist. It's a cool name for a god-awful profession if you want to call it that. The problem was so bad that people had to protect, like they had to guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. Or else these guys would come in and try and dig them up and sell your Nana for like 20 bucks. You have to stay there for four nights and guard her. That's great. No one should have to do that. The Victorian era sucked. No one should have to do that or this next one here. Number three, train engine cleaner. Yeah, this one's gonna suck. It sounds yucky already. For this job, you were required to get into, of course, pretty tough positions to, well, clean the engine of a train. Train engine cleaners would have to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out all that coal that was left over. Yeah, as if shoveling the coal in wasn't bad enough, now some guy's gotta crawl under and shovel it all out. Nope. They go underneath the train with a dusty ash pan and they work away all day long and nights. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains and then spend their nights climbing into the same furnace to clean it out. Every time I watch the Polar Express, it's always so magical, you know, it's always a great time. But even on the Polar Express, there's a guy shoveling coal all night long on Christmas Eve. You know what I mean? That's how bad this job is. Magic can't even save it. Couldn't even picture a worse job to have with this goofy back. Imagine that, imagine me doing this all day. No way, I'm gonna make it one week. Number two, funeral mute. Ah uh, yes, death. Happened quite a lot back then. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, you know, don't drop them, hmm? all that kind of stuff. Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Now Oliver Twist, one of the lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. All of her twists is like, this one sucks. One really sucks. Mutes were required to dress, of course, in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would be to, well, to stand and mourn and not say a thing the entire time. You'd have to stand at the door of the recently deceased home and just welcome death. Just embrace it. You have to be death. The mascot for death is now you. Horrible. In Victorian London too, you get to breathe in a fresh rotting body. Nice, that's good. I have about four days left, thank you. And after that point, you would lead the coffin all the way to the graveyard, nice and slow, like you were uh, leading a marching band. Only it's not music, it's death behind you. And finally, number one, a chimney sweep. I remember doing this when I was a kid. Okay, I got some questions now. I'm gonna make some phone calls after this list. I had to do this when I was a kid, but back then it was a lot worse. It wasn't a chore, it was an actual job. This was a terrible job to have in Victorian London, obviously. Chimney sweeps were famously young men. Guys, I can't say anything else here, but they were young lads. That's it. History is pretty horrible, right? You could fill it in. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that made it officially illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and clean a chimney. Nice, I was 18 cleaning my chimney at home. I had no idea, I could have busted out this law and been like, actually, three more years, dad. See ya, just moonwalk out of there. I'm not cleaning anything, just the kitchen for now. I'm not using that tiny little 
brush. Number 10, train engine cleaner. Ever wanted to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out the coal that was left in there? Ever wanted to go underneath a train where you can't fully stand up in the middle of the night and rake out a dusty ash pan, getting all kinds of ash and stuff in your mouth? Perfect! You can go join up with the railroad as a train engine cleaner. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains, and then spend their nights climbing into said furnace, cleaning it out, and then going out in the middle of the freezing cold, wet night into a trench covered in water and oil and dust, and get right up under that sucker and pull out all the ashes and dust and crap that came out of the engine while it had been running all day. Number 9. Linker Boy or Linker Men Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, the only gas lighting came in the form of small children who made you believe that you wouldn't be able to walk the streets without them tagging along with a torch to help guide your way. Then they'd expect a tip from you. Oh, rascals. They weren't so bad. They were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to point B while being able to see one foot in front of the other. And their charge was usually just one farthing, or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker boy, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from the time, and there were even some rather infamous ones, like Lawrence Casey, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Oi! Where you going mate? You forgot to like and subscribe to the channel. Oh, and while I've got your attention, why not take a little peek over at our Facebook, where you'll find behind the scenes content. Get on with it! Alright, alright, bloody hell, bloody hell. Number 8. Knock her up. No, not like that. God. Look. I despise my alarm clock. It wakes me out of my deeply deserved beauty sleep at 6 a.m. every weekday morning. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real person. That person is a knocker up, a person employed to wake up workers at mills and factories on early shifts, going from house to house using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows. In other words, a person employed to become the epitome of all my hatred in this world. If you had this job, well, you're not alive anymore, but I hate you. The people at the time were somewhat friendlier than they are now, and I'm sure the knocker-upper wasn't a horrible person, but I'm sure there had to be some grumpy gills who would put their hand on your chest for doing this to them. In our number seven spot today, we have the Crimean War. The Crimean War was a conflict fought between 1853 and 1856, primarily involving Russia and an alliance of France, Britain, the Ottoman Empire, and Sardinia. The war was fought over various territorial and religious disputes, particularly regarding the rights of Christians in the Ottoman Empire. The war was marked by high casualties, particularly from disease and poor medical care, and it is often seen as a turning point in military medicine. The war also featured some of the first extensive use of modern technologies such as telegraphs and railways, which greatly impacted warfare in the future. The war ended in a victory for the Allied forces, and it resulted in a significant shakeup of the balance of power in Europe. It also demonstrated the need for improved communication, organization and medical care in military conflicts, and it had significant long-term impacts on military and political strategies in Europe and beyond. In our number six spot today, we have the East End Outbreak. The East End Outbreak was an outbreak of cholera in 1866 and was a major epidemic that struck the densely populated area of East London, causing widespread illness and death. Cholera is a highly contagious disease that spreads through contaminated water, and in the Victorian era, London's water supply was notoriously unsanitary. The outbreak was particularly devastating in the East End, where poverty and overcrowding made residents more vulnerable to disease. The outbreak led to significant changes in public health policy and infrastructure, as well as increased public awareness of the importance of sanitation and hygiene. The physician Jon Snow, which, you know, feels like a weird name to say when I'm not talking about Game of Thrones, but the physician Jon Snow played a key role in identifying the source of the outbreak, tracing it to a contaminated water pump on Broad Street. His work really paved the way for the development of modern epidemiology and disease prevention. The the East End cholera outbreak remains a significant event in the history of public health and the struggle for social justice. It brought attention to the urgent need for clean water and adequate sanitation, and it helped to spur reforms that improved the health and well-being of people in urban areas. In our number 5 spot today, we have the London Burkers. This is the name used to refer to a notorious 
gang of body snatchers who operated in London in the early 19th century. They were involved in the illegal trade of selling corpses to medical schools for dissection and study, and they would often resort to killings to obtain the bodies. The most infamous member of the gang was William Burke, who along with his partner William Hare, committed a series of killings in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1828. They sold the corpses to the anatomist Robert Knox, who was unaware of their methods. Two of the group's members, John Bishop and Thomas Williams, were convicted of killings and sentenced to death. The London Burker scandal highlighted the demand for fresh corpses for medical research and contributed to the passage of the Anatomy Act of 1832, which allowed allowed for the legal procurement of corpses for medical purposes. Emphasis on the legal part of that, though. It's important. In our number four spot today, we have the Great Stink of London. The Great Stink of London was an environmental disaster that occurred in the summer of 1858. It was caused by the city's inadequate sewage system, which allowed raw sewage and waste to be dumped directly into the River Thames. The hot weather only exacerbated the problem, which is disgusting, and it caused the sewage to ferment and emit a foul odor that permeated the city. The smell was so overwhelming that it caused widespread illness and forced many people to flee the city. Parliament was forced to act, and a major engineering project was launched to build a modern sewage system for London. This project was led by engineer Joseph Bazalget, who designed a system of sewers and pumping stations that would carry sewage out of the city and into the Thames estuary. The construction of the new sewage system was a massive undertaking, involving the excavation of miles of tunnels and the construction of large pumping stations. It took several years to complete, but once it was finished, it greatly improved the health and hygiene of the city. The Great Stink was a turning point in the history of public health, and it helped to spur major improvements in sanitation and public health infrastructure across the developed world. Today, the legacy of the Great Stink lives on in the modern sewer systems and wastewater treatment facilities that are really essential for maintaining public health and environmental quality. In our number three spot today, we have Typhoid Mary. The Typhoid Mary case is a famous incident in the history of public health in the United States. States. Mary Mallon, also known as Typhoid Mary, was an asymptomatic carrier of the bacteria that causes typhoid fever, a potentially fatal disease. Despite being unaware of her condition, Mary inadvertently infected numerous people during her work as a cook in New York City in the early 1900s. After a number of typhoid outbreaks were traced back to Mary's cooking, she was tracked down and forcibly quarantined for several years. The case generated significant controversy at the time, with some arguing that Mary Mary's civil rights had been violated, and others maintaining that public safety justified her isolation. The Typhoid Mary case remains significant for its implications for public health policy and for the balance between individual rights and public safety. In our number two spot today, we have the Birmingham Riots. These riots took place in 1839, and they were a series of violent clashes that occurred in the city of Birmingham, England. The riots were sparked by tensions between two groups, the Chartists, who were calling for political reform and greater democratic representation and the authorities who opposed the movement. On July 4th, 1839, a group of Chartists held a rally in Birmingham's Bull Ring where they were met with opposition from local government agencies. The situation quickly escalated into violence with protesters and authorities engaging in brutal clashes that lasted for several days. The Birmingham riots of 1839 were significant for their role in the history of the Chartist movement and it is said that the events of 1839 demonstrated the lengths to which authorities were willing to go to suppress the movement. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Brown Dog Affair. This was a controversy that arose in the early 20th century in London over the use of animals in medical research. In 1903, a statue of a brown dog was erected in Battersea, which had been used in vivisection experiments by a scientist named William Bayless. If you're unfamiliar, vivisection is defined as, quote, the practice of performing operations on live animals for the purpose of experimentation or scientific research. While I am all for the advancement of science, I do believe in ethical studies, and this clearly was not that. The statue was intended as a memorial to the countless animals that had been used in medical research, but it was met with outrage from some people. Anti-vivisection groups saw it as a symbol of animal cruelty, while some medical researchers saw it as an attack on their work. In 1907, a group of medical students attacked the statue during a protest, sparking a violent confrontation with anti-vivisection 
activists. The statue was eventually removed by authorities, but the controversy continued to rage on for many years. The brown dog affair highlighted the deep divisions in society over the use of animals in medical research and contributed to the development of new laws and regulations aimed at protecting animal welfare. For 10, it's just a cold sore. The Victorian era is cool. The art, the fashion, and technology of the time, I think, are always fun to take a look at, especially since steampunk has its roots in the Victorian era. And who doesn't like steampunk? Come on, there's just a lot of cool steampunk stuff. And honestly, we haven't seen a lot of that in a long time. We need, we need more. We need more. Something not so cool from that era, however, was what you could catch from another person should you decide to take up a bed with another person. Syphilis, yep, one heck of a disease. Funny enough, it was so common that it was making intimacy itself an unusual practice. People were scared, and honestly, maybe rightfully so. There's no cure, and if it progresses to its later stages back then, well, you'd go crazy. And then you'd end up being that guy that's always screaming in the streets. Every city has one. You know what I'm talking about. Number nine, the French letter. The issues of intimacy and its repercussions were becoming quite clear in the Victorian era. Something had to be done, as spending any amount of time in the brothels could have you shucking barnacles off your lower deck in the morning, if you know what I mean. Introducing the revolutionary new invention, prophylactics. For those that are college age, you might find it disturbing that these party favors weren't made of rubber or disposable. Yeah, hear me out. They were made of sheep's guts and they had to be soaked first so they would become flexible. Because when you put these bad boys on, they had to be fastened on. It's not very good, not very attractive. Once the deed had been signed off on, the device was then washed and then hung up to dry like your dirty laundry. Once it was dry, it was placed in a small box for the next time because seeing your wife's ankles might make you feel a certain kind of way and now you just have it ready to go. And Number eight, the products of our sins. Having fun when the lights can be turned off is great. Who doesn't enjoy a little toe curling, yeah? Except sometimes there's this crazy thing that can happen where after nine months, another human spawns in. Insane, right? I know. Well, back in the Victorian era, this phenomenon was happening, but only for married couples. As you have to be married, of course, or else a child would be born out of wedlock, which to people at the time was just the worst. Oh, I never. These stigmas were not favorable for women, as some preferred to avoid that kind of press by abandoning or straight up just unaliving their children. Horrible, just, just horrible times. Just another one of those good old wholesome times in history where we were treating women with the utmost respect and decency. Very nice. We were actually not very nice. Number seven, a good thing. If I'm talking about medieval times, there's a good chance I'm gonna bring up the super not cool, not fun, do not condone or support the behavior of marrying a woman at the age of 12. Yucky. In part one, I mentioned that there was a ton of corners and streets being worked by the only other job besides street cleaners at 3 a.m. by women. However, after venereal disease was becoming a serious issue, it was getting pretty bad. It was becoming clear that a lot of people who were getting sick were young women. Like, 11 to 16 age group. Oof. Which I shouldn't have to tell you is bad. That, that's pretty bad, dude. When I was 16, I was rocking Black Ops 2, hanging out with my buddies, and partying hard in the summer. I got a lot of good stories. Maybe I'll share them one day. Catching all that nasty stuff is no way to spend your youth. So thank God the government changed the age of consent to 16 years old, which I know is not a solution for everything that was going on, but it was a small step forward in the right direction. That's what we like. Good history moving forward. We like that. Chetty likes. Number six, the seam seamstress. Being that the industrial revolution had started and business was booming, people needed to travel for business. Or more specifically, men needed to travel for business. Which means they gotta be away from their wives, and that means they are away from the very thing we're talking about today. Bedroom stuff. How did men solve this issue? Well, there was no shortage of ladies roaming street corners to uh, aid in, in that matter. However, there's an option with a little less syphilis. There were AIDS or early blow up dolls called travel ladies. Strangely enough, it was stored in a gentleman's hat. What? That's so wrong. Once it was ready to be used, it was inflated and reassembled. This is a quote from an ad from one of the products. It is inflated to the essential part of the woman wanted by a man. That just, that just doesn't sound very good. This is why we have boards of people to check stuff from products before it gets shipped out to the public. I feel like that just wouldn't fly very well today. Number five, 
big polluter. This just doesn't make any sense. It never did to me. And it still doesn't. But in case you didn't know, self-pleasure was a big no-no. Commonly called self-pollution, which honestly is very funny to me. That's just hilarious. Don't self-pollute yourself, Chris. That's bad. Don't do that. That's naughty. It was a sin and thought to be a cause for many ailments. I'm sure you've heard the classic saying that for guys, if you decided to go bump in the night by yourself, there's a good chance you'd need a walking stick because it would make you go blind. Women were also targeted, however, as for any pearl polishing by women was thought to be hysteric and needed to be treated for such. Look, the truth is, any man who wants to wax his chair or woman tuning a one dial radio should be able to do so without judgment of society or medical remedies of snake oil doctors. Love yourself, love everybody else, and just, as long as the bedroom door's closed, you're good. Just, just don't do it in public, you're good. Number four, shake and bake. I'm something of a scientist myself, but that doesn't mean I know everything. And if you actually need to learn something about health and safety, take it from a professional, not a second rate John Candy. However, when coming across this fact, I just had to share it. Cause with my medical knowledge, this just doesn't sound right. All right, so kids, we know how they're made. I don't need to go into detail for that. However, there was this idea back in the Victorian days that if a woman danced shortly after doing what mommy and daddies do, then there was a chance that her pregnancy just wouldn't happen. Or perhaps more commonly after riding a horse. S same idea, uh, okay. Which is frankly, horse. I mean, come on, my mom always told me when she was baking that I had to be quiet and stop running around the house or the cake she was baking wouldn't rise. Well, they always did. I love chocolate cake. I mean, really, I do. I'm starting to wonder if there's a connection here. I was a rowdy kid. Number three, the Kensington system. Poor Queen Victoria. I know this is kind of a stretch, but it relates back to the whole mistreating women thing. But basically, it was something implemented in order to control the young royal, make her dependent on her mother, whom she was not allowed to be without. Basically, modern day strict parents. Now, all the kids watching right now, or all the kids who've grown up, how well did that parenting work? Let us know in the comments. I'm willing to bet it created a little bit of a divide between parent and child, am I right? That's exactly what happened with Queen Victoria. Shouldn't be surprised, really. Being a parent is tough. I get that. But squeeze too hard and the sand falls through the cracks of your hand. Victoria wasn't even allowed an hour to herself. And I don't care who you are, no matter how charismatic or bubbly, everybody needs some alone time. Number two, a healthy breakfast. Okay, not Victorian London, but this is just too funny not to mention, and it's around the same time period, very close. As the great minds of the time thought, self-pollution was a big no-no, and the reason for these urges was often related to food. Some thought eating meat would make you down bad. So a man named John Harvey Kellogg, you might have heard of him, aimed to cure the sickness of self-love. What if a man had a delicious, nutritious meal to eat, especially at the start of his day? Cornflakes by Kellogg's, the, the very same cereal that's probably sitting on top of your fridge, yeah, was partially originally designed to stop you from feeling those carnal urges. Now, not sure if that works, I mean, Go ahead and tell me how you feel after eating a bowl of that. I had one this morning. I feel fine. I don't feel any different at all. I mean, I'm just, well, I'm not really feeling the same about Pam Anderson anymore, though. Number one, rising action. This could get some married couples into some trouble if they're watching. So sorry. It's going to be hard to talk about this without saying it because YouTube will send a stern letter if I do, but here it goes. The deed was not considered done unless both parties had signed off on it. Uh, had their toes curled, reaching the peak, your magnum opus, the way I feel when I eat at McDonald's, DEFCON 1, or simply mispronouncing organisms in health class. I feel like once you're involved, you're involved. And to me, that's a done deal. You can't really reverse it from that point on, regardless of any of my euphemisms, but that's what they thought. They thought if you didn't, you both didn't climb that mountain together, it didn't happen. Cause science. At number 10, death photography. Has anyone out there looked at really old photos and had that eerie thought that everyone in that photo is dead now? I have. I know it sounds kind of weird, but it's just something that comes to mind sometimes. Back in the Victorian era though, they really had that thought because death photography became a trend at the time. Back then, people were dropping like flies. 
They dealt with a lot of illnesses like measles, scarlet fever, diphtheria, rubella, typhus, and cholera. Death was all around them, but with the rise of photography, this became a new way of keeping a memento of their loved one who passed away. Before this, they would keep locks of hair and other items from their loved ones, but once they got access to cameras, families started posing with their dead relatives. Literally. Families would often keep the bodies of their dead loved one in the house for days after their passing in order to have that mourning period, but soon they started staging photo shoots with the remains of their relatives, posing them and dressing them up to make it look like they're still alive. Family members would take pictures with the deceased to have one last family portrait before burying their loved one. It's kind of heartwarming in a way, but also really creepy. At number 9, Emigration. During the Victorian era, there was unfortunately a lot of orphan children living in the streets of London. It became a pretty big problem because of the sheer amount of young people without homes or families. It was estimated that around 30,000 children were living on the streets in London in 1869. Soon a program was put into place to try and solve this issue and people started rounding up these orphan kids and shipping them off elsewhere to work in some of the British colonies. Many of the kids who were shipped off ended up working as farmhands or as domestic servants. Though many children were shipped off to places like New Zealand and Australia, the majority of them went to Canada. About 80,000 of them actually. They were sent away with hopes that they would be able to live better lives, but unfortunately for many of those kids, they didn't end up having any better luck in compared to when they lived on the streets. This practice ended up becoming pretty controversial as you can imagine. Before we carry on talking about the strange things that happened in the Victorian era, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Mental Health Back in the Victorian era, the study of the human brain and psyche was still relatively new, so no one really knew what was going on up in people's noggins. Mental asylums started to pop up, and people started getting diagnosed with mental problems, even if the diagnosis wasn't accurate. The three labels that a patient could fall under were the manic, the melancholic, and those with dementia. The symptoms for those big three labels often varied, and people were admitted to asylums for some pretty messed up reasons. There was a list of common causes for mental illness that people referred to back then, and it included things like, quote, laziness, novel reading, superstition, an immoral life, and intemperance, as well as the act of self-pleasuring. For women, they could also be sent to asylums for some pretty ridiculous reasons, like imaginary female trouble, hysteria, rumor of husband murder, and even fits of desertion of husband. I am so glad things have changed since then. Number seven, expectations. All right, this one goes out to all the married ladies in the audience. Hello, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks for asking. I'm curious as to why you got married and what your expectations were. Did you marry your high school sweetheart and live happily ever after? Maybe you had a shotgun wedding and after one night at the saloon. Maybe you just really wanted to find a nice man and settle down, start a family, be a mother. I think any of those options are great, so as long as you have options. In Victorian England, you were expected to do the latter. Women were expected to get married and have kids, and that's about it, really. My question is, why were angles and wrists an issue, but giving birth isn't? What I mean is it's kind of a compromising position to be in. All I'm asking is that the girls get treated fairly and given choices and be allowed to show some ankle. It doesn't make any sense. You can look at her business down there, but you can't show an ankle. That doesn't make any sense. I'm a magician. Number six, double standard. Divorce sucks. It's no fun. The person you once loved and cherished is now the villain in your story. I love McDonald's and I don't ever want them to be the villain in my story. I love you guys. Gotta get those Happy Meals. Divorce is something that isn't new. Honestly, it was probably invented the second after marriage was. In Victorian times, men had the right to divorce their wife if they had committed adultery. Women could not. Well, if you refer to my last part, you know that men were doing more than a little window shopping when it came to women. When men left town for business, they would have hired the services of a woman who patrol the streets at night. No, I'm not talking about Batwoman either. So men can divorce women if they dare to do what they did on a regular basis. Yeah, that's that's totally fair, not, yeah, that's good, equal, absolutely, yeah. Number five, emo girl. All the forever alone people, raise your hand. Let me hear you roar XD. 
I like to joke around a lot and say I'm a lawyer, a firefighter, and the cutest guy on the whole wide internet. But if there's one thing I know, it's people. I like people. I love them. I spend a lot of time with them, and after hearing this, I've come to the conclusion that this is where the emo girls come from. I figured it all out. It's down to a science. I'm a scientist now. Do you ever get that feeling in your tummy on Valentine's Day because you know it's going to be another one alone? And you'll be forced to be on your own, and, and, and that means sad music and crying in your room. Same, it's, it's Drake's Marvin room for me. Well, single women in Victorian times had similar issues. Since women were expected to marry and have kids, single women who were also forever alone were pitied by society, which I argue is just way worse. Who, who, no one wants to be pitied. Ugh. Number four, gold diggers. She take my money when I'm in need. As she drive Okay, anyway, back to the actual content. Well, not exactly. While today in a place like sunny California, you might see an older man with a woman who's half his age. Maybe he's driving a nice car, or she's got on the very best and latest from Louis Vuitton. Stylish, yeah. Most of us think some thoughts about what we might think is going on there. We can kind of be judgmental sometimes when we see things like that. However, looking through a lens of 2022 to Victorian times might make the women of Victorian times appear to be gold diggers, but in reality, it was because all of their financials were tied to their husbands, legally too. Which, if you can imagine, that system didn't work too well. What if your husband is broke? What if your husband is running amok with sultry lasses on the street corners? Like I said before, no divorce, but even if she could leave him easily, supporting herself afterwards was going to be an issue, especially financially. Number three, birth factory. Just pump them out. The faster the better. Quantity over quality, or just, just get them out. The use of birth control, as you can tell, was not a common practice. Anyone who's over the age of 25, ask your grandparents how many brothers and sisters they have. I'm willing to bet it's in the six to eight range. Let me know in the comments below, I'm curious. A trend that would continue for a few decades after. Education is important, and I'll get to that in my next part. Women were simply expected to act this way. Maybe it was the sign of the times since the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. Maybe the factories needed workers, I don't know. Which in case you didn't know, they used children as employees. Maybe not so nice. Unfortunately, that was when there was an issue, and there were many. They had no HR to go to, and that was the least of their worries, really. Number two, no school for you. No higher education for women. Banned from going to university. I don't think so, not very nice, no, no. Honestly, any society that doesn't want half of their population to go to school probably has a few things to work out. It's a boys club and they can only go to university so that they can learn to be smarter and be businessmen, so they can earn money and thus have the facilities to court a woman who really doesn't have a choice anyway. Women had jobs, not careers. And they were all the jobs that you can think of. The ones that were too feminine for men as women were too feeble to participate in a men's job, which is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I'm happy to say that in 2022, we showed them wrong. Chetty loves everyone. Just remember that, I love everybody. You go, girls. Number one, strict rules. Okay, so after a night in the bed sheets with the gal that you love, or maybe the one that you found, there's a good chance that nine months later, a smaller version of you two could be walking around. A byproduct of intimacy, if you will. This was always something I wanted to rant about, but I always found it strange how strict parents and teachers from this time were with their kids. You gotta brush your hair, bed made, and whatever you do, don't ask for more gruel. Please sir, could I have some more? Whatever that Charles Dickens book was, I think it was Oliver Twist. They made us read those books as kids, and I don't know why, because they're kind of boring. From the extreme military code ethics happening at home to the long days in a factory at work, being a kid was tough, man. Earning the punk rock blues of today. Number 10, Boy Jones. What's more intimate than a stalker? Am I right, ladies? If there's one thing women have loved throughout history, it's having every set of their privacy being watched by some creepy man, right? No, I can only imagine it's been worse since the dawn of smartphones and social media. I just, that must be horrible. Well, as it turns out, there were some real creep wads in the Victorian era too. The boy Jones was a stalker of Queen Victoria who on multiple occasions snuck his way into Buckingham Palace, one time escaping with a pair of the Queen's underwear. What? Arrested multiple times, but still somehow found his way back to the palace. But what they should have done was swap the queen's underwear for a pair of mine after a shift in the garden center I used to work at. Oh yeah, nobody's coming for you after sniffing those bad boys. Oh! Number nine, graceful words. 
This was a time when ladies were supposed to be ladies, and that means manners are on the table and elbows are off. Dresses were worn to not show ankles, God forbid an ankle or wrist bust out. I think more importantly however, or rather unusual that is, is that women were expected to talk a certain way. Good evening Mr. Barrows, you must excuse my tardiness, there was a dreadful man screaming at me because my ankles were shown whilst mounting my carriage. Your what was showing love? Oh you hurdle it, I can't believe it, excuse me, I must be someone else. I don't need to tell you guys how ridiculous that is. I say fly out the handle ladies, wear what you want, do what you want. Number 8. Shots. Not the kind I like. Well, I don't know about you guys, but nothing ruins the mood for me and my lady like being fired upon. Yikes. I'd like to stay the night kid, but the automatic gunfire coming from outside is starting to get to me. See? All gangster impressions aside, things must have been that way for poor Queen Victoria as she was shot in her carriage in 1840. A young man fired two shots at her carriage. More attacks would actually follow in the coming years. It's kind of hard to feel that certain kind of way after bullets go grazing past your pretty face. The worst thing that ever happened to my generation was making sure nobody was home when you were studying with your boyfriend. I was too busy playing Call of Duty, but at least I never got actually shot at. You know what I mean? That's just a good thing. Number 7. Diet Bedroom misconduct was becoming a huge issue. Refer to number 9 and 10. While women did get most of the blame because, well, you know, history, men did get some of the blame. The issue of intimacy for men could be described as barbaric primal sense. So how do we curb this? How do we stop men from acting on these caveman urges, ooga booga? Well, simple really. Men just have to stop eating certain foods, as it was thought at the time that food had a link to the misconduct, or rather, the overabundance of bedroom related issues, including mustard, pepper, rich gravy, beer, wine, cider, and tobacco. And if you weren't paying attention, that's basically the diet of every man in Victorian times. Not sure how a jar of finely prepped mustard would get you flustered, but okay, sure. The beer makes sense though, you know, have a few beers, and even the mop leaning over in the corner looks pretty lonely, and boy, that mop has lovely hair. Number six, job market. Ladies of the evening, women of the night. Women who make beds go bump in the night. They were everywhere in Victorian London, a lot. It's partially related to some of the points I previously mentioned. Now I'm not here to say it's necessarily a bad thing. Personally I don't think it is. As they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, with an estimated 80,000 women working in the night by the late 1890s. You'd have to be crazy to miss that, I mean they, they were literally everywhere. With numbers like that, there's something for everyone and in varying price ranges, as they can be found in brothels or townhomes set up by the wealthy men for their mistresses, pretty much anywhere trouble likes to spawn. Even some artists took advantage of this by living with the gorgeous girls of the evening, as going behind closed doors with one was debatable, but becoming friends? Now that's a social transgression. That, oh, becoming friend, oh, how dare you befriend the people of the night. Number 5. Jolly Lad When people think about certain magazines that depict lewd imagery, you probably only think of Playboy. The bunny imagery was good marketing honestly, just, just smart. But what if I told you the Hefmeister wasn't the first to publish such a magazine or imagery? Back in the Victorian era, there was some saucy imagery being produced. The government had outlawed such indecency, but this only made the lewd picture industry move underground, where naturally it flourished. Especially in major cities. And if you knew where to go and how to ask for one, you could purchase something from the hidden menu. Kind of like when you go to McDonald's, yeah, there's a hidden menu there too. Google it and see for yourself. I'd repeat what my favorite one is, but I would be in trouble from the YouTube gods. And I've been trading on thin ice this whole video, so uh... Number 4. The First Counterculture The 1960s were a very important time for many different people. Black Americans were fighting for the rights, music went from holding hands to strawberry fields if you know what I'm saying, and everything that your parents told you just, just kind of felt wrong. If you grew up then you know what I mean. I know people like to make fun of hippies, but there was some good ideas there. Well, in 1890s England, they were sort of having the same thing happen. Obviously not as strong as a push as it was in the 60s, but still. Basically after all the oppression towards bedroom relations, people began to open up. Uh, not literally, just, just open up thinking wise, that's really gross, don't repeat that. There's only one way we all got here. Unless you're a test tube baby of course, in that case thank you for watching CT133576-2. 
To some historians, this makes sense. When you push and push for things to happen or ban, eventually people will push back. Especially if it's something like bedroom time. Everybody, everybody likes a little bit of bedroom time. Valentine's Day wasn't too long ago. Remember that? It was good. It was fun. It was good, good fun. Number three, Jack the Ripper. While the man's numbers don't compare to any of the other horrible people in history, he's unusual because of his brutality and the fact that he was never caught. Jack the Ripper was maybe the first modern serial on a liver. He haunted the streets of Victorian London and is responsible for claiming multiple women's lives, women of the evening to be exact, and they began to know the name Jack the Ripper. Now, we'll probably just have to show you pictures of Victoria London or maybe some B-roll of a shadowy figure because there ain't no way we can show the crime scenes. There's probably a dozen different theories on who done it. Some say it was multiple men using his name as an alias. Some say it was Prince Albert. There's even some who suggest that he was a she, and which explains why women were so easy to go off with Jack. That actually kind of makes sense to me at least, and why no one really would be looking for a woman back then. Kind of makes sense. Anyway, be careful out there, ladies. Just, just be careful. Number two, Queen Victoria. It seems old Blighty herself may have been a tad more promiscuous than you'd think a royal to be. Well, not with other men, but her husband. Who in her diary claims to be the love of her life, which honestly is kind of sweet and, and romantic. That's nice. One thing that I find interesting, however, is that while lewd images were outlawed, the queen may have commissioned a painting of herself that was quite risque for the time. To gift to her husband, of course. Hypocrisy much? I say lewd, but it was probably just in her loose fitting clothes with maybe like an ankle showing or something. Still, unusual behavior for the queen. I'll remember that one next time, Bly. I'll remember that. Number one, Prince Albert. If you've ever stepped foot into a tattoo parlor, then you might know where I'm going with this. Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, had some controversy circulating his name. One, because he shares a name with another Prince Albert, who was speculated to be Jack the Ripper, but also because of a very unique piercing. Go ahead and take a guess where that piercing is. Yeah, I didn't think so. As a man, if your anatomy could be described by an internet comedian using moderately funny euphemisms, then the piercing would go through your German army helmet. That makes sense, right? The horror, the absolute horror. It's rumored that he had one of these piercings. Did he? I, I'm not sure. But if it means anything to you, Nicholas II had a tattoo, so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. Number 10, no calling, no gifts. This is a time in history when men were told to be gentlemen and women told to be ladies. Naturally, that came with some weird social practices. For instance, women were discouraged from accepting gifts from men. Personally, I like to give my girlfriend flowers and chocolate. I'm a classic guy, what can I say? Can't go wrong with that. However, even if a handsome silver-tongued devil such as myself were to give some flowers and the finest dark chocolate a 7-Eleven has to offer, and a most promising woman were to accept said gifts, she may not be able to call me back. Literally because well, the phone isn't exactly a thing yet, and also because that's something else women were just discouraged from doing. Pfft. Call on a man? No way, Jose! Even if he is super nice and waiting for a genuine response. One etiquette guidebook from 1882 called any woman who calls on a man ill-bred and positively improper to do so. I like when people give me flowers and chocolate. Maybe call me sometimes, I'm a little lonely. Number nine, act like a lady. How dare ladies do anything unladylike? Oh, said every man ever in the Victorian era. This is a time in history when ladies gotta be ladylike. That means makeup, corsets, and, and don't you dare do anything masculine. Oh, that's me angry. This is still a time when food isn't the greatest either, so imagine if you got an upset tummy at the dinner table. Happens to me a lot. You've got a handsome prince that your parents have arranged for you to marry. When you go to greet him, you do it with a simple gesture, as kneeling to curtsy could turn your linens a certain shade of embarrassment that 1800 stain cleaning technology could never wash away. You'd poop yourself. Where's Billy Mays when you need him, right? How dare a woman do such things as go number two, or even worse, break wind? Oh, the nerve. That's just the way it went, folks. I don't make the rules. Number eight, charged with love. Naturally, this was the past, and not being open to homosexuality was just the way it was. Especially when tucking yourself into bed at night alone wasn't allowed either. Homosexuality just wasn't gonna happen. They, they just weren't gonna be approved of it. It's just how it goes. It sucks. However, it's almost as if there's been love on this earth since day one, and to stop that kind of love, it's just silly, man. Wherever I go, everyone is welcome on this channel. Or my Twitch. Chetty loves everyone, because in reality, this is a time period where you could wind up in jail for that kind of love. And as Awesome Powers would say, 
That's just not very groovy, baby. Yeah. Strangely enough, homosexual relationships between women might have been completely overlooked as they were sometimes mistaken for women being friends. Yeah, I know. Some women even lived together. But given that they probably needed each other for financial support, people just kind of thought that's how it went and they ignored it. It's like they live together and you start putting the pieces together and it's like, you know, they, I don't know, something weird going on there. But love everybody, come on, be nice. At number seven, Grave Robber. When you think of jobs back in the Victorian era, you might think of things like chimney sweeps and lawyers. But another relatively popular, though questionable profession was being a grave robber. Yes, people actually made a living off robbing graves. As people studied medicine, they needed cadavers to practice on, but there was a law saying that only the bodies of those who had been executed for a crime could be used as a cadaver. And since the laws changed to include less and less crimes having death penalties, soon people started running out of cadavers to practice on, and this gave way to the boom in the grave robbing industry. People can make a pretty penny for snatching bodies from cemeteries and selling them to medical professionals and students. Fresher bodies went for more money, and the grave robbers not only made money off the sale of the cadaver, but they also charged a fee, so they ended up with a little extra cash in their pockets. Eventually, the grave robbing business became such a big problem that cemeteries started installing watchtowers and guards to prevent people from getting away with the dead. At number six, beauty. I've talked about this before in some past videos, but the Victorian era was famous for its strange beauty practices, so I just had to include it on this list. You're probably familiar with the makeup from the Victorian era. Women often painted their faces white to look as pale as possible, but even though they believed it made them look beautiful, it also did a lot of harm to their health. The white face paint that women would use was lead based, and as we all by now, lead makes you dead. But this white lead paint isn't the only thing that harms people's skin. Women would also wash their faces with ammonia to make their skin look paler. At night, women would rub opium on their faces, and if they were really dedicated to their beauty regime, they would also ingest arsenic. They were literally poisoning themselves in the name of beauty. Women would also use mercury on their eyebrows and eyelashes, and would use lemon juice or belladonna in their eyes, which could cause blindness in some people. Once again, I'm glad things have changed. At number five, no divorce. Nowadays, divorce is quite common. All you have to do is sign a paper and you're done. But back in the Victorian era, before the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1857 allowed divorce, people had to find different ways of getting rid of their spouses. After all, just because there was no divorce doesn't mean that everyone was happy in their marriages. It turns out that in order to solve their problems and get rid of their spouse, people would just sell their wives, either in public or in private sales. Most of the time, a man would take his wife to the town square and just sell her off to a new man. According to some records, some women had the power to veto a sale, and sometimes it was for cash. Though I think the cheapest that a wife was ever sold for was a pint of beer. This wasn't necessarily bad for the woman, because if she was sold to someone else, things could sometimes work out, and she could live a better life with a better spouse. And if she didn't, then she would just get sold again and get to try her luck with a new man. At number four, food additives. These days, people are becoming more and more concerned with artificial additives in their food. All natural, organic, pesticide, and hormone-free food is becoming more and more popular, but back in the Victorian era, people were putting all kinds of additives in their noms, and a lot of it was really, really bad for you. Like, we're talking deadly. Chalk and alum were often added to bread dough to make it whiter, and sometimes pipe clay, plaster of Paris, or sawdust was added to the mix as well. Red lead was sometimes added to cheese, lead was added to cider, mustard, wine, sugars, and candies, copper sulfates were used in preserving fruits, jams, and wine, mercury was was used in candies, and even ice cream was made using a water and chalk mixture. All of these unsafe ingredients are actually what prompted the food safety industry because no matter what's going on, you shouldn't be eating lead, chalk, and mercury. At number three, corpse medicine. Now earlier I mentioned the whole grave robber industry and how that really took off during the Victorian era, but now let's talk about how they used corpses in their medicine. Back then, some people believed that consuming certain parts of the human body could cure their ailments. I know. Gross, right? One of the more popular medicines back then was a mixture made with human skull and chocolate, and it was believed to cure apoplexy. Back in the Victorian era, medical texts were published describing what parts of the human body could be used to treat specific ailments. One text describes mixing the skull of a young woman with treacle to treat epilepsy. Another text says that you could treat paralysis with a candle made of human fat. Apparently, executioners were linked to this type of medicine as they would, you know, execute someone and then use the remaining 
remains to become a doctor and treat people's illnesses. Imagine Grey's Anatomy, but with Victorian medicine. Sounds like an interesting thing to watch, but also probably not to experience. At number two, mummies. Speaking of dead people though, people from the Victorian era were oddly fascinated with mummies. I mean, I can understand the fascination to a certain extent because they're old and cool, but of course, these people just had to be extra weird and take that obsession with mummies to heights that they didn't need to be. People used ground up mummies to make paint, Pieces of mummies were sold in jars, and they were even used in advertising. One candy shop put a mummy on display in the store, claiming that it was the daughter of a pharaoh who saved baby Moses. I mean, that's weird, right? I understand that this was all happening as archaeologists were starting to uncover lost treasures and secrets from Egypt, but I mean, a mummy in a candy shop? Seems a little much. And finally at number one, baby farmers. Now for what I believe is probably the most disturbing thing from the Victorian era, baby farmers. Basically this was an industry of women who would take unwanted babies and either take care of them, give them to new parents, or unfortunately have them disposed of. One famous case of the darker side of baby farmers comes from a woman named Amelia Dyer. She was known to have charged women a lot of money to take their babies off their hands, but unfortunately the children wouldn't survive Amelia's care. It is believed that Amelia was responsible for the passings of hundreds of babies, making her one of the biggest monsters of the Victorian era. Number 10 on the countdown is the cat's meat man or woman. We all know that the Egyptians worship cats, as many cultures do. But did you know that the cat overpopulation in the 1800s London area created a job called cat meat sellers? Always one of the most popular street sellers of the 1800s. If you think they sold cat meat, you're entirely wrong. Don't worry. These vendors were actually selling meat to cats themselves. Primarily horse, it was said that 26,000 horses that were maimed or past their workability were slaughtered a year. For London's report, 300,000 street cats that were existing in the 1860s. When the cat's meat seller appeared, feline owners were encouraged by their cats mewing to bestow upon their favorite pet a delectable treat for a mere half penny. You may be wondering how this could be one of the worst jobs to have. Well, pushing around a hot stinking cart of horse meat has its cons, such as disease and rot. Depending on where you sold, you could be making a fortune or you could be barely scraping by. The hungry and homeless would often follow, harass, and sometimes burglarize cat meat sellers for meat or money. Also their stocking behavior did scare off clientele or drew more complaints from the commoners. Personally I couldn't think of something cuter than a little trolley going around town delivering food to kittens. Prepare to go downhill however because this next job is a lot less lighthearted than cat meat delivery. At number 9 in our countdown is the resurrectionists. Money was tight for many as I had mentioned but how low are you willing to go as a person to get what you need? Well if you're willing to dig up somebody's grandma it could put hundreds in your coin purse. In the early in the early 19th century, the only cadavers available to medical schools and anatomists were that of executed criminals. It was also mandatory for medical students to do an autopsy to graduate, and they had to source their own body. This demand for bodies was often unmet, resulting in medical schools and their students offering extreme amounts of money for the delivery of a fresh body. Thus, resurrectionists are born. Sneaking into cemeteries at night, they would prowl around for a fresh grave site and then dig up the recently deceased. However, bodies could only be sold if they were within a certain time period of freshness. And as grave robbing became more common, many family members of the recently deceased would take turns standing guard for nights in a row to ensure that the body lay undisturbed until it was considered unsalvageable for cash. In 1832, the Anatomy Act was imposed due to the actions of William Burke and William Hare, who are believed to have murdered 16 people between 1827 and 1828, just one year, all to sell to the University of Edinburgh. This act did give doctors and anatomists greater access to cadavers and allowed people to leave their bodies to medical science, overall helping end the resurrectionists era. While sourcing the dead may make for a fat paycheck, I think this is a profession nobody should attempt to resurrect. Speaking of the dead, have you ever considered eating off their lap? Okay, well not quite literally off their lap, but number 8 on the countdown is sin eaters. Sin eating is a job that really only affects you if you have a discomfort with death or a religious slash spiritual. It was believed that when someone religious was to die after a life led of sins, such as gluttony, lust, pride, or crime and cruelty towards others, their family would sometimes feel that the only way to guarantee their loved ones access to heaven is through someone living taking on the weight of their 
sins. While the act is against the church's wishes, sin eaters go back as far as the 17th century. Depending on the family or the deceased, the meal served may be specific, but traditionally it was just a piece of bread. Placed on the chest of the laid out body, it was believed to supposedly suck up the sins of the dead, clearing them for a passage to heaven. Once the sins had been captured in the bread, the sin eater would sit on a stool facing the door and eat the bread before washing the bread down with a bowl of ale. Because he was a man who would willingly take on the sins of other people, he was often solitary in the community. However, sin eaters fetched a pretty fair price for the act. I mean, if it is true that you're taking on someone else's bad karma, you'd at least want to be compensated for that, right? Sin eating remained popular in England and Wales all the way to the turn of the 20th century when England's last sin eater, Richard Munslow, died in Rattling Hope in 1906. Like sin eaters, our next job was one of public scrutiny and rejection. Number seven, Queen Victoria's eighth child. First of all, eighth, kudos. Here's a fact that we don't talk about enough. Let's do this. First of all, I have no idea what it's like to give birth. I hear the comparisons and what it feels like, whatever, and it makes me want to faint. It's like peeing a watermelon or something like that. It's, I'm gonna faint just talking about it. The fact that you can endure this pain is beyond me. And the fact that you want to as well, Kudos. Now imagine being the queen and having the public, like everybody, talk smack about you and how you decide to give birth for the eighth time. Yeah, April 7th, 1853, Queen Victoria decided to use chloroform as an anesthetic delivery. Now everybody at this point, that you know wasn't a scientist, they were sure to voice their opinions on the matter. It was a huge controversy, although this act directly spread the awareness of this medical advancement. I mean, yeah, it sounds, you know, they're like, yeah, don't do that. But can you do that? We don't really know. We're eating bread. Number six, grave bells. Oh, this one gives me chills. Here we go. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, and anything and everything was spreading. It was not an ideal time, wasn't very safe. Many were biting the bullet at this time, sadly, of course, being gravely ill. But with this came a dark trend, the safety coffin. Yeah. Just a backup coffin. These coffins, Lord forbid you are buried alive, these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again. Nice, like it's Michael Jackson's thriller. They would just come up and be like, oh, ho, ho, guess who's back? Back in the Thames, here we go. All these coffins have extra comfort on the inside and a wire. This wire ran through the coffin and then attached to a bell on the outside, on the you know ground floor. So if a passerby or heard it, well, thy would know something's up. Folks would get creative with their safety coffins. I mean, you know, they'd personalize it. Like for example, a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester. He passed in 1791, but instructed his family and watchmen to open this special door that would reveal a layer of glass. So that's real haunting to find. Hey, look up like a grandpa. Yeah, he looks good, eh? Patent number 81,437. It was actually granted to France Vester in 1868, and it was an improved burial case. Just a glass case with someone who may or may not be alive inside. 50-50. It had an air inlet, a ladder, and of course, a bell. The description of the patent says, if too weak to ascend by the ladder, they can ring the bell, giving the desired alarm for help, and thus save themselves from premature death by being buried alive. So now I ask you, if you're walking in a graveyard and you heard a bell ringing, what, we just could start digging and be like, ah, I think I heard something. I don't know. Let's just disrupt the skeleton. Number five, gym day. Believe it or not, they were around 200 gyms all across Europe during Victorian times. Dudes were getting shredded. Why not? They're like, hey, we don't have dinner, but might as well just work out. These gyms weren't bright. They weren't open. They weren't well ventilated, motivating, safe. None of those things that you need today. No, Victorian gyms were reserved for the upper class. Uh, yes, of course. Grab your pocket watch and your blazer, Ezekiel. We're doing some bench pressing today, I guess. Yeah, grab your monocle for sure. You're going to need that. These machines also, they were not ideal to work out. They were designed as antiques first, rather than, you know, their fitness purpose and safety purpose also. Like, half these look like saw traps. There's no way I'm gonna be bending my arm around any of these Victorian devices. Even the machines today at the gym, I'm like, no way, no thank you. Weak gang, here we go. Number four, beauty patches. Okay, we have to bring back beauty patches ASAP. Imagine like if a rapper had a beauty patch. Now they had the band-aid, but we gotta have like beauty patches. We gotta like, you know, mix it up a bit. Bring back the facial feature game. These patches came in all shapes and sizes, of course, in the Victorian era. Even in this portrait from 1755, Joshua Reynolds painted Charles, the ninth Lord Cathcart, rocking a large beauty patch. That looks amazing. He does look like Nelly, honestly. He has like that motivational, like rapper kind of like, you know, he, he's, he's in charge and you can tell from the beauty patch. It's like that's a lord right there with that one of those. Take it off, no lord. Put it back on, 
Lord. The reason for these patches back then, and sometimes having more than one, is because they were commonly used to cover up smallpox scars. They were made out of silk, velvet, and they were applied with glue. So pick a spot and commit. It's gonna be there all day. These patches were dark black and they were meant to make your pale skin pop. Of course, pale skin back then made everyone faint. Pale, pale skin and long shoes, everyone's losing their minds. The position of these patches could also determine your political allegiance. How funny is that? Historian Joseph Addison took note of these positions when he observed two parties from the 1800s. Now one party had patches on the right side and the other had the opposite. It's pretty, pretty amazing. It's a pretty easy way to flip jerseys, right? The other team starts winning, you're like, you know what? Check it out, now I'm on this side, prove it. Number three, chimney sweep. Ah, terrible jobs, here we go. I remember when I was younger, I had to sweep the chimney in the house and I loved it, I thought it was cool. I thought it was like a little safety, like secret room. I don't know, it wasn't safe at all actually, it was just a dirty room. Had a little broom too, I always loved using that little broom. Little tiny sweeps, one at a time. Little tiny bag to go along with it, so gentle. This was a terrible job to have in Victorian London, obviously. Chimney sweeps were famously young as well. I can't say anything else there, but these guys were young lads. History is horrible. Maybe that's why I was doing it, right? Because I could fit inside of the thing, that makes sense. 1840 was a good year, all things considered. A law was passed that made it illegal for anybody under the age of 21 to climb in and clean a chimney. I was 18 cleaning my chimney. I had no idea, I could have used this great law and got out of the whole chore, shame. Number two, Jack the Ripper. Unidentified to this day, who is he? How did he get away with it? And also, when are we gonna see a Netflix documentary on this guy? We have everybody else in this multiverse of killers. Where's this guy? Could complete the image. Well, it's because we didn't find him. Jack the Ripper was active in the East London neighborhoods, primarily, and sadly, he would target sex workers at the time. He famously took the lives of five women from August to November of 1888, and they were believed to have been connected to Jack the Ripper, although some sources claim that he was active until 1891. It's hard to tell who's who and who's doing what. Again, this is also so long ago. There's no cameras. Hard to catch someone. Many believe Jack the Ripper had some anatomical knowledge due to the way that he left his victims as well, which is creepy. While there were some suspects, including a member of the British royal family, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper was never identified, so. Yeah, that sucks, really. We gotta find him. Can't, but we gotta. And finally, number one, mudlarks. Yeah, we'll get dirty for this last one here, why not? Victorian London around the 1840s, it was a bit of a mess. Everyone was sick, a lot of sore throats, to say the least. The jobs that were available, they sucked. They certainly didn't help you, you know, survive. The jobs that were available had you catching rats and crawling into sewers. One of the worst jobs to have was that of a mudlark. Now, as the name hints towards, a mudlark involved getting in deep in the mud and muck that would build up alongside the Thames River. Yeah, that dirty river back then. They're like, yeah, just go through the, the lining of that. See what's in there. Ugh. This one was reserved, again, for the younger folk with, you know, the, uh, the, the patellas that still worked, you know, digging in the mud, of course. Can't have an old guy in there. He's not gonna come back out. It was like working in quicksand. It was horrible. It was exhausting. Not to mention the chances of being whisked away by the river at any given moment. Yeah, it sucked. All for the slim chance of finding a pocket watch or some driftwood, rags, something, anything really worth your troubles. Kicking off the list at number 10, a lot of hair. To kick off this wild part two, I had to include the tale of the woman who ate her own hair. Why did she do it? What happened? How much hair? Well, let's find out. All the questions about to be answered. The Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 got the attention of those passerbyers with this one. A 30 year old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. That's not too far off from the average life expectancy of the 1800s. But this case, this case was a little odd. Something was off about it. So doctors asked the family if they could carry out a post mortem. And lo and behold, a two pound solid chunk of hair was sitting in her stomach. It caused ulcerations of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. What a horrible way to go out. The woman's sister didn't know that over the last dozen years or so, she had been casually eating her own hair. Just one piece every now and then. Ultimately, it added up. If you know anybody that's eating their own hair, pass this on, send them this video. This sounds rather uncomfortable. Number nine, cat attack. If I have to pick, I would say I'm 100% a dog guy. Cats are cool, don't get me wrong, but this next story freaks me out a bit. Also, I had a cat once and I pulled its tail on it. <laughs> pissed at me and scratched me and scared the life out of me. So, dog, dogs for sure. Back in 1870, a rich woman had put her time, energy, and resources into cat breeding. What a fun little hobby and lifestyle. She had tons of cats, she loved them all equally, and they loved her. 
I'm allergic also, so this story is my nightmare on a level. But it does sound like a cute time, I'll admit, that's a nice way. Especially like in the Victorian era, what a, what a lovely little pocket of fun. 1800s, a lot of candles, everything being extremely flammable, disaster hit often in Victorian times. And in 1870, a fire broke out of this young woman's home, and the cats were sadly trapped in the house. They made it out alive, but by the time they made it out, the two maids that had kicked the door open to rescue them, they had gone full primal. The cats just attacked them, and it was all bad. The fire in the house had obviously scared them, so when the doors were open, these two maids were both attacked by them at full force, essentially, all of these cats. Like, what a horrible thank you for saving all of their lives, you know what I mean? Number eight, quick divorce. Let's just say the love thing isn't working out, okay? It happens, people change, but now what? Say it's the Victorian era, but divorce in England isn't allowed until 1857, and it's 1856. So now what are we gonna do? Well, considering what list we're on and which part it is, it's pretty wildly unfair. If you were the wife, you were getting sold in this scenario. How horrible is that? Wife sellers, they were a thing. That was a legitimate business, how horrible. Yeah, you were getting sold if you were the wife, how horrible is that? Wife sellers was a legitimate business. There were auctions, public auctions would be done. You would watch people bid on marrying your wife. At like noon, middle of the day, people are walking by like, oh, do I have any change, hang on. This is insane. One real sale that happened in 1862 was in Selby. The asking price was a beer. The asking price for this person's wife was one pint. Sold, just like that, that's crazy. Sold, drank, now I'm married. That's insane. Other times, most of the time, it was a rather expensive exchange. I feel like there are plenty of cases where this would honestly be the ideal scenario. Just get it done in one day, whatever, peace. See you again, bye, you're the worst. Number seven is mudlarking. Victorian mudlarks are the original foragers of the foreshore. They would be scavenging for anything on exposed riverbed which they could sell in order to survive. This was the last ditch resort. People would hike up trousers and wade their feet around in sludge, feeling with toes as well as fingers for items that may be lost or discarded in the mud. All ages participated in this activity. However, it was usually those who were the most affected by poverty that were taking part. As a result, those seen mudlarking were considered shameful and the lowest of society. River Thames was the most famous for mudlarking in the Victorian era, as it was renowned dumping ground that saw endless amounts of product travel through it. It was also a highly impoverished area, which made the desperation to make money all the more grand, filling their water banks with the poor. Mudlarking actually isn't out of practice nowadays, but it has changed significantly. Nowadays it can be a fun group or solo activity that on occasion does require a permit. You can join mudlarking groups or do tours while traveling. It seems that sifting through garbage garbage was an unfortunate trend in the Victorian era as toshers make number 6 in our countdown. Toshers, a fun word to say, the job, not so much. Unlike mudlarking, which was in the riverbeds, these workers went underground for their winnings. The Victorian era saw the development of sewer systems, and the poor saw opportunity in them. Toshers descended into the sewers to sift through raw sewage and find any valuable that may have fallen down the drains. It was extremely dangerous work, as noxious gas fumes formed deadly airless pockets, and since sewers were newer, the tunnels frequently crumbled from inefficient building. There were swarms of rats that had little fear of humans, and at any moment, the sluices might just open for a fresh wave of filthy water and feces to come crashing through. After 1840, it did become illegal to enter the sewers without permission. Rather than abandon the trade, toshers began working late at night or early in the morning to avoid detection. It may have been a stinky job, but it was also one of the most profitable on our list today. I guess you'd go nose blind after a little bit. Right? Hopefully. On a warm summer day, the last thing you want after jumping into the lake on your cabin trip is to emerge covered in leeches. However, in the Victorian era, that would be a prime location for the leech collectors, which are coming in at number five on our worst jobs countdown. Leeches are nowadays seen as little more than slimy and creepy creatures, but believe it or not, they used to be a valuable commodity in the fields of beauty and medicines. This job was often fulfilled by poor women living in the country and farmland regions. Wearing shorts or hefting up their long skirt, these women would wade into dirty ponds and waterbeds alike with exposed legs so as to tempt the leeches. When enough leeches were attached to them, the women would climb back out of the pool and scrape the blood suckers into metal pots and bowls. Seeing as leeches can survive up to a year without food or in their natural environment, this wasn't always a profitable trade unless you could find someone in dire or consistent need of leeches. Doctors did use leeches to aid in the curing process of all sorts of conditions, ranging from a stomach ache to joint pain to female hysteria, if you know what I'm talking. 
talking about. Despite being used in medicine, leech collection posed major threats of deadly diseases and blood loss to their collectors. Suffice to say, I don't think I have any interest in going to a doctor's office if I'm going to be prescribed a leeching. Being given the duty of helping prevent and stop the spread of disease in your community would be an incredibly high honor. But maybe wait to sign that job contract until you hear the details. Nightmen definitely make it into our worst jobs countdown, taking the place at number 4. These men would wander the streets at night working what may be one of the most revolting jobs imaginable, collecting human feces off the street for proper disposal. They would dig up the feces from chamber pots, street wells, ditches, sewer holes, you name it. By the time the sun would begin to rise, the carts would be full of the city's excrement, which would then be carried off and reused as fertilizers for the crop that they later consumed. Yummy. Part of being one of the only people up at night means you're a valuable set of eyes. There are reports of nightmen catching burglars or SA in the act, or being called to bloody scenes by members of the public to provide alibis. There's also hundreds of cases where nightmen are the ones to find bodies of those who had met their ends out on the street. After a long, solitary night of collecting feces and seeing these crimes unfold, a nightman would collect his 23 shillings, which is $75 today, at the end of the week and go home to rest before starting it all over again. Since we're already discussing dung, let's get this next one out of the way because it somehow may genuinely be a little bit worse than the last. At number 3, this is the Pure Finders. Please do not be deceived by the name because this job is anything but pure. In the Victorian era, tanners, who are leather workers, would use dog dung in their practice. Referred to as pure for how it purified the leather and ensured its soft flexibility, dog dung became a hot commodity due to the Victorian demand for leather. Leather was being used for just about anything as it was the hottest trend of this era. It was also being used for things like tack for horses and the necessary creation of shoes and books. To meet demands, tanners needed more dog dung, and so pure finding became a career. These finders would go deep into the cities and their sewers, trying to find where stray dog packs amassed so they could score the biggest load. Whenever dung was found, it'd be retrieved and placed into a covered bucket that would later be sold to a tanner. To make it a little worse for you guys, only some collectors wore a glove to protect their dung handling hand. But others considered it harder to keep a glove clean than a hand and they opted out of the protection altogether. Yeah, think about that one. I feel like if this next job didn't exist, then maybe we wouldn't have needed the cat meat sellers from our first point in the countdown. Considered one of the most disease riddled jobs of the Victorian era, it's rat catchers coming in second on our list today. The government was smart. It knew its people were suffering and that many were starving and struggling to make ends meet. So they issued a statement willing to pay people to deal with the rat infestations. Every rat would earn people a little extra cash. If someone could catch more than 5,000 rats in a year, they'd earn special privileges. While 5,000 sounds like it would be a lot, it's essentially 13 per day, and it only takes 21 to 23 days for a rat to give birth to its litter. I think you can do the math. It's said that the government's encouragement of rat catching in this time was the stepping stones towards more plague and diseases to come, as desperate poverty driven people made poor attempts to catch these rats and caught the illnesses from them. Others cheated the rules. Some people actually intentionally bred rat colonies to supplement their captured rodents. Rat catching became such a lucrative business that gangs formed around it. And murders even took place when the cheaters were discovered or if somebody infiltrated somebody else's ratting territory. Between the venomous competition and high risk of disease resulting in death, it's safe to say that rat catching may have been one of the worst jobs. And now, what may be the worst of the worst for number one slot, let's learn about the history of matchmakers. No, this isn't the romantic kind of matchmaking unfortunately, but it's rather the business of matches itself. Working what was often a 14 hour shift, matchmakers were predominantly women who were immigrants, living in poverty, widowed, just overall in a bad situation for an era where women had pretty much zero rights. They were compensated poorly, often sexually harassed or assaulted by their management, and even forced to pay fines to their workplace should they be tardy or damage anything they worked on. Working with white phosphorus, the material found in the tip of the match to enable the instant strike anywhere effect, was highly toxic and responsible for a devastating disease known as Fossy Jaw. This nickname was given by the matchmakers to the particularly nasty condition that would cause the jawbone to rot and become disfigured. Eventually this infection would spread to the brain and cause debilitating symptoms and extreme pain prior to death. 
death. Should the jawbone be removed in time, some women were able to survive longer with the condition, but nothing was guaranteed once Fosse Jaw had set in. Famously, an article written by a matchstick girl named Annie Besant exposed the conditions of matchstick companies in London. Infuriated, the factory owners fired her and attempted to force signatures of their other staff, stating that they were happy with their working lives. Refusing to do so, by the end of day, 1,400 women had gone out on strike. Their demands were eventually met, but only 20 years later. It wasn't until 1906 that white phosphorus was made illegal in the use of matchsticks in the UK. The matchstick girls were a revolutionary step towards the deliverance of women's right and autonomy, a journey that we're still on today. Number 10, marriage. All good women have lost a marriage into war, famine, disease, and disaster. I know some might think initially that this isn't a punishment, but in the cases of the Victorian women, the societal status of being a woman was only seen based off of the ideologies that needed to be pure and clean. Your bodies were seen as temples, and it shouldn't be decorated with jewelry, nor should it be used for physical activities or your own personal pleasures. You couldn't oppose men, and you being wealthy or a spinster was the only exception. Single women were looked down on with shame and pitied, and as your main purpose as a woman was to marry and reproduce. Even young girls at the age of 8 to 12 would stop working, as if there was no child labor laws or protection laws for children, and as, soon as they, and as soon as these women or young girls were able to menstruate, they would be negotiated into marriage and no longer be able to sustain themselves financially or just be a kid. And being a poor married woman wasn't an option as you had no individual rights under law. Married women were only seen as one with their husband and the husband would be the manager and entitled to all of your properties as it was seen more as a business and you were being micromanaged constantly until death do you part. Number 9, no rights. As I mentioned with marriage, women didn't have any rights as they were seen primarily as second class citizens and if you were a woman of color, my goodness, you were definitely seen less than human. Women who had to be married ended up losing everything they owned, inherited or earned and it would belong to their husband. Once a woman married, of any property she owned as well as any income she received from it passed her husband. Although he could not dispose of it without her consent, her property, her personal property such as money or earnings or investments and personal belongings such as jewelry passed absolutely into his control. She could not part with them without his consent and if you were in a loveless marriage or a harmful one, you couldn't divorce your husband. Divorce wasn't even a concept for women to execute without losing their own amenities, even in the court of law until the 1970s, almost a hundred years or so later, after the spark of the women's suffrage movement in the mid-18 late in the mid-late 1800s. So men had the right to divorce his wife under the grounds of adultery, but women had to prove her husband was unfaithful combined with other allegations including cruelty, bigamy, incest, and so on. Luckily, in the 1857 act, divorce did become a bit easier little by little, but again, only under the impression that the woman had legal grounds and proof her husband was unfaithful with evidentiary support to back up her claims. And even then, she could finally earn some of her possessions. As for the husbands, if he wanted to divorce his wife, he didn't have to do anything. He could just say it and it would be fine. Number eight, no education. To me, education is extremely important as it was something I learned growing up in my family. That education liberates you to understand yourself, those around you, and the world better. And for women in this era, they were received less education than men. They were banned from universities and could only obtain low income paying jobs as she was not allowed to follow a profession as they were all close to women. And the irony of them having Queen Victoria as the reigning accolade of this era, a woman and women of these times couldn't get an education to liberate herself or her children from defamation if the husband no longer sees her as a useful asset. So for women, especially those who could afford it, was raised in a privileged household with financial backings and exceptional family background, her education was only seen as accomplishments. Like, oh darling, she's a very accomplished woman. It's something you might hear in these type of movies that depict the era. Which only indicates that she had artistic talents like singing, dancing, and knowing foreign languages, and anything to help earn them a husband, and be a benefit in the house. Even doctors at this time believed that if a woman studied too much education, she would stunt her ability to reproduce. Wild as hell. And when university allowed women to attend their lecture halls, their families would actually forbid them from going, worried that it would prevent them from finding a husband. Number 7, Fire Hazard Christmas. Like all families at Christmas, we all have our traditions. I'm a good boy all year, so Santa can bring me lots of gifts. Thanks, Santa. My family tradition is to watch the National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation every year. I love that movie. Adam, on the other hand, well, he's a bad boy, and he eats all the chocolate out of his advent calendar before it's time. Don't tell him I said anything though. I can't help it, I'm sorry. He's right there. However, one family Christmas tradition was quite popular back in Victorian times, oftentimes called Snapdragon. Uh, the basis of this game was to get a large bowl, fill it with dad's brandy, and drop some large raisins in said bowl. Next, get a candle or a match and uh, light it up. Now that there's a large cauldron of flaming liquid and fireballs in your living room, now your objective is to try and knock the raisins out of the dish without getting burned. 
fun for the whole family, why not? Just be mindful, you know, that the whole house is made of wood and there's no fire alarms and there's no modern firefighting equipment and everyone's wearing long gowns and you get the point. Number six, maybe we were apes? November 24th, 1859 marks the day that none other than Charles Darwin published the famous and even infamous On the Origin of Species, presenting his theory of natural selection and questioning the theory of creation. Truly a great day in my opinion. Look, we can talk evolution versus creation in the comments, but there is no denying the evidence presented in On the Origin of Species had people turning heads and questioning everything they thought they knew. Its full title, on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life kinda explains it, but basically, Charles' book gave us the idea that species evolve over generations through the process of natural selection, which he backed up with evidence from the Beagle Expedition in the 1830s, which to my disappointment had nothing to do with the dog breed Beagles. Number five, the potato famine. The potato, so rugged, so versatile. Think of all the ways you can prepare a potato. Boiled, broiled, baked, mashed, pan fried, deep fried, french fries, hash browns, latkes, and sometimes you can put them in soup or stew. Usually pretty cheap and filling. The food of peasants and I love it. However, during 1845 Ireland, a fungus outbreak was taking hold of potato harvest all over the country. Thus creating a large famine that would see over one million people perish in a famine. Queen Victoria tried to help but was ineffective. And by help, I mean the same effort I put into reaching for the TV remote that's too far away on a lazy Sunday. Number four, body snatching. Look, back in the day, making a buck was not so easy. Some people who had absolutely no morals went this route. Basically, you wait around for a recently vacant grave to be not vacant. And before the soil can settle, you remove the inhabitant of said grave and go to your local university and say, Right, I've got this here fresh non-mangled corpse, give me some money and it's all yours. And Bob's your uncle, you are now the very bottom of the barrel, the tritus of human existence. But hey, you made some moolah and can afford to eat your next meal. Honestly, while you may be the worst of the worst people, it's partially the doctors and schools that are to blame for even accepting these fresh, illegally exhumed corpses for study in the first place. It may not sound like a specific event, but um, some people dressed up for it, so there's that. Number three, the tube in it. The London Underground, baby, the world's first subway. Which, let me tell you, it's kind of annoying living in Canada when you have two very popular franchises that share two common names for a rapid underground train. Metro and Subway, right? It's so annoying. You Google Metro and Subway and then the grocery store comes? I never have that. Okay. It's, maybe it's that, a me thing. A it's a me thing. Tunnels underneath the city and trains travel through it. It's simple. Well, the first one was opened in 1863, which is an engineering feat to say the least. And it feels like forever ago. I mean, that's older than Canada for crying out loud. When you think of the Victorian era, you think horses, carriages, top hats, and orphans asking for more gruel. Mind you, the locomotive was different from a modern one, but this is a very modern idea, especially considering that there's no cars yet. Kind of a weird thing. Number two, the telephone. On March 7th, 1876, Scotsman Alexander Graham Bell got a patent for his invention of the telephone. Three days after acquiring the patent, Mr. Bell made his first phone call to his assistant, Thomas A. Watson, saying, Watson, come here, I want to see ya. And that was that. And we've gone downhill ever since. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. The telephone is a huge groundbreaking invention allowing people to communicate across vast distances. But the phone addiction some of us have to deal with now, man, it's rough. Alexander Graham Bell was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, and the whole reason he became interested in the idea of creating the telephone was because of his mother, who was deaf, and his father, Alexander Melville Bell, who was a teacher of elocution, and was famous for the phonetic transcription system he had developed to help the deaf learn to speak, which is really quite sweet, actually. Number one, the war to end all wars. Out of all my research about the Victorian era, the start was somewhat muddy. Maybe because historians don't want to take away from North American or Napoleon history. But the end of the Victorian era was more clear. 1914, the war to end all wars. This was the big one, folks. A mixture of militarism, imperialism, alliances, and a power struggle uh, made for a powder keg that ended up exploding in 1914. Unlike a lot of wars, this one actually changed things. Empires fell while others got stronger. Countries on maps were being redrawn. 
Others stayed the same. The culture? Well, it changed too. What did it? I'm not sure exactly, but what I do know is that when sitting in a wet, freezing, muddy trench for months on end, well, that's horrible, especially when the only thing you have to look at is a red paste that used to be your comrades. It was not a good time. And it made a lot of folks go a little, you know, a little green. Starting our list off at number 10, the first postage stamp. Uh, uh, uh. Nice, who's the first guy who licked the stamp? Why'd he do it, right? We'll start off with stamp facts. Why not? I know there's a couple pen pals out there that still use snail mail. That's cool, this one's for you. May 1st, 1840, the world's first ever postage stamp was sold, of course, for one penny. Pretty cheap, nice, we love it. The sale changed history. Now on the stamp was of course a portrait of one Queen Victoria, world's first ever profile photo for a letter. Here we go, they're like, oh, who is this? Who's this little person here? Of course this caught on, definitely caught on. More than 70 million letters were sent within the next year. And then that tripled only a few years later. And of course it thrived for 40 years. Do you still use letters? If so, write into us, write some fan mail. Forget the comments, write into us with a pen with your autograph too, where you live. Yeah, no one's doing that anymore. Number nine, Alexander Graham Bell. I have no idea how phones work. I know it's vibrations and signals and I have to do this occasionally to help it out, but scientifically, nothing. I can't wrap my brain around this technology. Still, I'm 28 years old and I have YouTube, couldn't tell you. If I was sent back in time right now, I wouldn't beat Alexander Graham Bell. I would just watch him and wouldn't change history one bit. Guy's a wizard. On March 7th, 1876, Alexander Graham Bell received a patent on his invention, the telephone. And just three days later, he made it work, somehow. The world's first phone call was of course to his assistant, Thomas Watson. Now I'm from the generation that had T9 and I thought that was bad. I also didn't have that, you know, one of these, we have to like, go around and around a bunch of times. T9 was way worse than anything. You have to Morse code message all your friends. Ugh, we have it too easy today. Never forget about Alexander Graham Bell. Hit that thumbs up on your smartphone for Alexander Graham Bell. How, how does it work? Hello? Number eight, Queen Victoria's death. You may have heard the phrase, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Sounds very Westeros, doesn't it? Sounds like the British Empire is in an alternate universe or something, I don't know. But this is meant in a literal sense. On January 22nd, 1901, the Victorian era came to a close, of course, after the death of Queen Victoria herself. She passed away at age 81, and Queen Victoria was succeeded by her oldest son, King Edward VII. Now, at this time, the British Empire literally took up more than one fifth of all of Earth's land. So the sun actually did not set on the British Empire. It's a real phrase. It's not just a fun bit there. Number seven, the right to work. Work was only available to those who had no choice, as their societal status prevented them from leveling up to the ladder to have a better life independently. Even more so women who are labeled as part of the working class, these women fueled the industrial revolutions, making up to 60 to 80% of the working force in light industries such as cotton manufacturing. Even more so those who were labeled as part of the working class, women of these era fueled the industrial revolutions, making up to 60 to 80% of the workforce in light industries such as cotton manufacturing. Women that had jobs outside of the home made them less likely to marry, leaving them with no choice but to stay in, in undesirable situations that made them undesirable themselves. In one study in the Buffalo State, in one study by the Buffalo State had noticed classing women and children together as helpless creatures, needing the protection of strong men, they were indignant at the knowledge that women had to support themselves, that they had suffered degrading wrongs as working women. So for some, they'd have to result themselves into committing adult work, or even for some unfortunate circumstances, be sold into adult work as they had often had heavy debts from predecessors or even used as bargaining chips for their partners. Poor women were not regarded as the Victorian society as they could not fight back as men had captured these women, straight up kidnapping them, and kept them at their house. Differences in societal classes led to some women being ignored and not acknowledged in society for economic reasons and for the pleasures of some men. Women of the night had no exits of this profession and were stuck in this life, and they would be beaten, tormented, as this was obviously shamed on, as well as being arrested, which would lead us to number six. Number six, women who were in prison. In some revolutionary standpoints, being in prison might make you look like a hero or a villain, and as it depends of what you were doing or what you stood for. For the Victorian era, women who had been the most vocal at this time for a multitude of things like women's rights, the women who were caught in the act of selling their bodies in order to obtain financial means would be arrested and sent to prison. But even women who were not adult workers would be arrested. Women who had premarital pregnancies, turincies, or adultery or kept bad company would also be arrested. They would be sent to prisons or reformities as for women of these times, a small step off of the Victorian pedestal made for a long fall. Women sent to prison in the Victorian England were subjected to regimes whose projects was 
was to enforce idealized femininity. This individualized treatment aimed at more regeneration than discipline and was administered by an entirely female staff aided by middle class philanthropic lady visitors. Considering women were placed only into two categories, being a wife and a mother, the reality is that they lived in a world that discriminated heavily against them. Due to their superior physical strength, men considered themselves the dominant sex and sought to keep women subdued for as long as they could. Number 5. Prison Life being accused of being an idle and disorderly woman seems like a very vague and inconvenient statement today as it holds no worthy of prosecution, but for these women of these times, you would definitely go to jail for that. These roughly defined offenses were common charges against women in the 18th century. At least in some records of the names of these women have survived, there are two on the list who are sadly identified only known as an unknown, unknown woman, cannot give any account of herself and the other being accused of being a vagrant and an idiot. Which of course being an idiot isn't a crime unless you're doing something idiotic that hurts another person then yeah, I guess being being an idiot is a crime. It is possible that up to two thirds of prisoners in the House of Corrections, like the one at the prison called the Wakefield House of Correction, were female. Beating hemp was the usual form of hard labor, as well as if the women refused to comply or being able to commit to task, women as well as if the women refused to comply or unable to commit to tasks, whipping and beatings were also a commonplace, particularly to those who convicted of vagrancy, lewd, con lewd conduct, and night walking. Number four, domestic harm. It's a sort of stemming back to the whole marriage thing in number 10, as it basically ties in on how horrible life was being a woman in the Victorian era, or just being a woman in general in any historical time. With these sacrifices and determinations of these women as they ensure the women like me were able to gain access slowly but surely to equal rights, but sadly when it comes to marriage for some of these women, they're also at risk of being being in harmful relationships that were extremely normalized at the time. Violence against women and the lack of protection was common as there were no laws for the physical violations they had to endure. After all, when you got married, everything you owned belonged to your husband and so did your body with or without consent. Domestic violence was an issue that captivated the Victorian imagination due to the unprecedented visibility that domestic harm began to receive in the press and the emergence of an ongoing debate during the 1840s and the 1850s. Domestic violence was an issue that captivated the Victorian imagination due to the unprecedented visibility that domestic harm began to receive in the press and the emergence of an ongoing debate during the 1840s and 1850s about the domestic harm and other marriage issues that affected women, like all laws that slowly opened gateways to other clauses, the 1828 Offenses Act that targets working class violence helped a cultural shift on the subject and domestic violence became a topic to the public. Number 3. The Angel of the House or the angel in the house. When it came to the liberation, it all stemmed with the women's rights groups fought for equality and over time made strides in attaining rights and privileges. However, many Victorian women endured their husband's control and even cruelty including sensual violence, verbal abuse and economic deprivation. And there's no way out of it as it got worse as a man named Coventry Patmore published a book called Angel in the House. It consisted of poems and the ideal Victorian marriage and although it came from a place of grief at the loss of his first wife, the book had suddenly became a staple in women's behaviors and marriages and then became became a standard of their status. A woman's proper role was to love, honor, and obey her husband. As her marriage vows stated, a wife's place in the family hierarchy was secondary to her husband but far from being considered unimportant. A wife's duty to tend to her husband and properly raise her children were considered crucial cornerstones of social stability by the Victorians. Representations of ideal wives were abundant in Victorian culture, providing women of their role models, and the Victorian ideal of the tirelessly patient, sacrificing wife is what depicted the angel in the house. And for these middle class women, mimicking the angel in the house gave them more opportunities to find a successful match in marriage. Number 2. The House General The House General, in a term coined in 1861 by Isabel Beaton, by Isabella Beaton in her influential manual, Mrs. Beaton's Book of Household Management, because for women they needed a manual on how to be a good wife, a good woman, and a good so on and so forth, here she explained that the mistress of the house is comparable to the commander of an army or the leader of an enterprise. To run a, to run a respectful household and secure the happiness and comfort and well-being of her family, she must perform her duties intellectually and thoroughly. For example, she had to organize delegate and instruct her servants, which was not an easy task as many of them were not reliable. Isabella Beaton's upper class readers may also have a large compl complement of domestics, a staff requiring supervisions by mistress of the house. Beaton's advised her readers to maintain a housekeeping account book to track spending. She recommends entries and checking the balance monthly, but also keep in mind this is the same lady who told people to put borax in bread to save money. This may not seem like a big punishment for some viewers, but if you were told to this may not seem like a big punishment for some viewers, but if you were told that you needed a manual to how to live your life so you wouldn't be kicked out of society, that's not something that's a preference today, is it? And number one, asylum. 
Now, if you're a woman who was out of the realms and just didn't want to be part of society like everyone else, maybe just suffered a series of mental health issues or even just looked ugly, you might find yourself in an asylum. They had such ridiculous reasons to lock up a woman, as I mentioned in the prison section on this list, from being a vagrant, disorderly, or whatever the case was, you'd go to prison, or even more so, to the asylum. For some families, if they just didn't know what to do with you, they'd just toss you into the asylum for not being complicit. In an investigation by a very passionate and an amazing writer named Nellie Bly, she had experienced firsthand on the field of the mistreatments, the devastating conditions, and harm patients had to endure. In her report published in 1887 and later published in the book 10 Days in the Madhouse, it caused such a sensation it prompted the asylum to implement reforms and shed the light on the significant impact on American culture. Anyways, being a woman was tough as hell in the Victorian era, but with their determination for the right to vote, the women's suffrage movement that enforced lawmakers to ensure them to obtain sustainability today is the reason why there are so many generally incredible women who are able to become who they want to be. And it is important to note, those who do not know how to look back at where they came from will never get to their destination. So be sure to read up and learn a lot, after all the answer in our future is laid dormant in our past. Number 10, Albert. Adam. How is Queen Victoria's marriage to Prince Albert bizarre? Well, my little honeybees, not to be a pessimist, but it's bizarre because they actually really did love each other. Uh? Be honest, how often do you think it occurred that people of royal or noble birth actually got to marry someone they genuinely loved? On February 10th, 1840, Queen Victoria married Prince Albert of Saxe Coburg Gotha, who, interestingly, was her first cousin and who was actually kind of not the favorite of the British people who saw him as an outsider. As queen, she was the one to propose. Good for you, queen. Literally. The couple stayed married for 21 years until Albert died of typhoid in 1861. And together, the couple had nine children. Nine. Even after his death, Queen Victoria continued to make ruling decisions based on the principle of what would Albert do? It's such a nice way to start this heinous list. Number nine, Napoleonic Wars. Okay, a little bit of a stretch, but I would argue the Victorian era lasted from about 1814 to 1914. There's no specific date, but it could be classified around this time. The Napoleonic Wars were essentially world wars started by one man, the Corsican Ogre. Hello. Imagine having the whole world against you. No, really, the whole world against you. Britain, Prussia, Russia, Austria, and sometimes Italy took part in the coalition wars, which were just part of Napoleon's story. Trust me, this dude was arrogant and he was the antagonist of the story. He's been labeled as the greatest tactician ever. When it was all said and done, he had rediscovered ancient Egypt, fought many battles, and managed to become emperor. And he got banished twice. Eight, mummy unwrapping parties. What is your favorite idea of a get together? Let me know down below, I won't judge, I promise. Unless, of course, you say mummy unwrapping parties like some people in the Victorian era might have. Then I will indeed judge you. Thanks to the Napoleonic Wars making their way to Egypt, interest in the country was on the up and up. And while people have been buying mummies since the Elizabethan era, now these rich weirdos bought even more, bringing them back as souvenirs. Once they got to the homestead, they would almost instantly hold parties with all their rich friends where they would unwrap their mummies like a Christmas present. Congratulations! It's exactly what you thought it would be! A five or six thousand year old decaying corpse that smells horrible. Why are rich people like this? I, I don't get it. Number seven, the Great Famine. We're gonna lean out a wife selling for a hot minute and include the boys for this one. Yeah, come on back in, you're all guilty. The Great Famine took out everybody, not just Victorian women, of course. Back in 1845, potato crop that a lot of the Irish population was relying on was no longer available all of a sudden. A group of microorganisms just wiped them out, just like that, and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people that really needed it. So this famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. A little fun bit of history I had to include on this one. Number six, the Brooklyn Theater Stampede. And we're back to absolute horribleness. Here we go. I love the theater. When the pandemic shut down plays, I actually felt pretty sad. I like sitting in full rooms watching a guy in a fake wig monologue about Mozart. Like that's my ideal Saturday night. That's the best. I don't want that to not be a thing anymore. I love theater. But today we have an obnoxious amount of distractions that can take you out of the experience. Guy's texting fighting his ex-girlfriend two rows ahead of me. I'm trying to watch Joseph in the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. I'm like, man, it's not the same anymore. Theater's not the same anymore. Turn off your phone, throw a tomato at him. It can be distracting. Exit signs can also be pretty distracting, but we need them. 
we definitely need them. Because in 1876, the Brooklyn Theater caught fire after a single lantern fell over on stage during a performance. This was 1876. Everybody was wearing flammable attire. There aren't emergency exits yet. A fire marshal hadn't come in and counted heads at this point, so it was a disaster. 278 people lost their lives. A monument was put up after the incident. It shook the town. It was absolutely horrible. I read about this and I was like, that's horrible. We got included in. This is a horrible list. Number five, the hobble skirt. Yeah, so when people can't get out of burning theaters, it's stuff like this to blame. Just from this 1910 headline alone, I'm glad we don't have hobble skirts anymore. The June 12, 1910 headline reads, the hobble skirt is the latest freak in women's fashions. The latest freak. Skirts that are so tight around the ankle that locomotion is seriously impeded and speed is impossible. Nice. I'll take two, debit. Doesn't that sound like a bad time? Why would anyone want this? Sounds like you're gonna be late for everything. French designer Paul Poirier made these to free the bust, to free the, you know, have a lot of room in here, whilst shackling the legs. So you in turn have to, you can't move. Just what you need to move around uneven stone roads, I guess. Love the practicality on this one, Paul, thanks. Despite how ridiculous and unsafe the hobble skirt looks and acts, only the wealthy could afford such a thing. Shoot, Ah, oh, man, must be nice. I'll just be over here wearing jeans like an idiot. Middle and lower class women wore skirts with slits or buttons so they could, you know, actually walk around. Yeah, what fools. Oh, sorry, you want a button? <laughs> I don't speak broke, sweetie. Number four, lead based. When I started here at the studio a year and a half ago, maybe two years, I was like, okay, I gotta put on face cream maybe. A lot, of, a lot of lights, a lot of HD this. Time to get rid of these bags under my eyes finally. I don't know, maybe drink some water. See what happens. Finding a skincare routine of any sorts is easy now, dare I say. The lovely World Wide Web has our back. You can learn how to draw your eyebrows on while listening to true crime. It's wonderful where we are today. But the cosmetic game, whew, back in the 18th century, not great. Turns out, wasn't that great. Not that safe. RuPaul's drag race would have been a lethal sport, know what I mean? Back in the 18th century, lead mixed with vinegar was often used to make your face look, you know, more pale. The Victorian look, I guess, gotta have those veins pop out. A splash of sulfur for those freckles. Horrible idea. Queen Elizabeth I used cosmetics containing lead, mercury, and or arsenic. The same poison that took out George III and Napoleon Bonaparte. So, not safe at all in any time, period. In fact, arsenic was on the priority list of hazardous substances, and toxic metal exposure is still an issue we're facing in this era, let alone Victorian. Number three, the Kensington system. Ah, oh, this was horrible. Queen Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard it before is awful. I was grounded more often than not growing up, I'll admit, you know, I was the youngest of three, so I tried some shady stuff every now and then, but this, this is another level. At least I could go to the washroom without supervision, you know what I mean? Yeah, buckle up. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, she created this Kensington system to control her daughter. She literally isolated the child from friends, family members, anybody, everybody, you name it. Her mother would monitor her every action on top of this, including who she can see or speak to, if there were any of those people at some point. Victoria only had two playmates growing up her entire life. She had her half-sister, Princess Theodora of Lenigan, and then the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoria. I mean, I had like four friends growing up, you know, maybe five, five and a half, but this is just cruel, this is just unfair. Especially with a royalty too, you'd think you can have more things. No, less. She shared a room with her mother until she was a queen. That entire time, she literally couldn't walk down the hallway alone. Victoria has reflected on her childhood, and yeah, in case you're wondering, she hates John Conrad. She referred to him as a demon incarnate, so she's got the words. Number two, arsenic dresses. If looks could kill, literally. You've heard of arsenic and old lace at some point, but what exactly are we talking about? Back in 1861, a poet by the name of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, real name, his wife, Fanny, also real name, her dress caught on fire and her burns were so bad that of course she sadly didn't survive. But this was sadly common in Victorian days. Puffy dresses, open candles, as we heard earlier. These dresses back then, they were flammable as is, but some of them were made with literal poison. Some of them had arsenic made to have that like green look, like the real arsenic green look. It wasn't just in clothing either. Back in 1861, an artificial flower maker named Matilda Schurer used green arsenic laced powder and her fingernails had turned green and green foam started coming out of her mouth and it was just a horrible way to go out. Arsenic is not supposed to be inhaled, let alone worn. Although yeah, it did look nice for a hot minute. Not worth it. 
And finally, number one, Queen Victoria's Threads. Being the queen and all, and we're talking about the Victorian era, I figured we'd end with this one. Being the queen and all, a security team is always needed, and during her reign, there were multiple, multiple attempts to harm the young queen. The first attack was back in 1840. It was an 18 year old man named Edward Oxford, and he fired towards the queen's carriage, but obviously and luckily missed. But when Edward was accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. Then a couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her. They were found guilty. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, thankfully, but of course, she was shook. Then again in 1842, 1849, and 1872, attempt after attempt. But then things got a little worse. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened here, I saved it for last because it's extremely unsettling. A teenager stalked the queen back in 1838 until 1841. Edward Jones, AKA Boy Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. It was some Assassin's Creed type stuff. He just knew some back way, he climbed some window or whatever. The guy just knew a route in. So he would break in and would more often than not just hide under the queen's sofa. He would sit on her throne sometimes and one of the worst things ever, he would go through her drawers and like go through her clothes and stuff. It was creepy. He would steal her clothes until eventually and thankfully he got caught. Rule number 10 is going to be follow the moral encyclopedia. For ordinary young men and women desperately desiring physical and emotional intimacy, yet having to navigate a dating culture that required them to act a certain way, well, it meant self-help books were all the rage. And women in particular drowned in them, thanks to the fact that these books were often written by hypocritical men and had been used since for medieval time to dictate and instruct women on how to become the perfect submissive little doll. Some examples are Henry Butter's ominously titled Maiden, Prepare to Become a Happy Wife and Mother from 1868, and Hayden Brown's Advice to Single Women from 1899. Perhaps most famously though on advising the morals of young women was the Moral Encyclopedia by Charles Varl, which had been making young women hate themselves since 1861. It was a bestseller of its day thanks to the marketing that only decent and morally driven women would own it. To prove themselves as that woman, Victorian gals flocked to the bookstore to absorb some menial patriarchal crap that goes as follows. Read no novels, but let your study be history, geography, biography, and other instructive books. Also, trust no female acquaintance, i.e. make no confidant of anyone, because we don't want you ganging up together. Oh, I mean, possibly breaking your feeble tongues, having a conversation. Oh, and if you get a pimple, expect nobody to ever love you again. To quote, remember that whereas the character of a young lady is considered angelic, and blemish in it would withdraw the respect men have for you. Rule number nine is to follow a handbook of etiquette for ladies. Following on a similar sales tactic of gaslighting, only perfect and honorable women know all the rules of etiquette. Oh, you don't? Oh, well, that's such a shame. Now you lose all your honor. You know, though, I can help you out. It's pretty convenient that right here behind me, I have this book I wrote and it has all the rules. I mean, I can give it to you so you can restore your honor if you give me like $30, I don't know. So what's in this immensely popular bestseller from the 1860s that bullies women? Well, I'm so glad you asked. First up, Keep that bling to a minimal mamas as you should never wear mosaic gold or paste diamonds They are representative of a mean ambition to appear what you are not and most likely what you ought not to wish to be You got a problem with that? Well sucks pipe down because it's better to say too little than too much in company Let your conversation be consistent with your gender and age Don't forget to never talk about yourself either as such discussions cannot be interesting to others And the probability is that the most patient listener is laying the foundation for some tale to make you appear ridiculous. If you do open your mouth and your choice is to be a dirty joke, girl BFF because a double entendre is detestable in a woman, especially when perpetrated in the presence of men. No man of taste can respect any woman who's guilty of it. Oh, my personal favorite. Did you break something while a guest in someone else's house? Nah. As a lady, you can't do that. It's not possible. Pretend like nothing ever happened. Don't own up to it and gaslight your host. About another's house, should you break anything, do not appear to notice it. Your hostess, if a lady, would take no notice of the calamity, nor say, as is sometimes done by ill-bred persons, oh, it is of no consequence.
consequence. Rule number eight is having a dress for all occasions. Should you not? Well, that's not proper etiquette. As a middle or upper middle class Victorian woman, your job was to spend your day like a brat's doll, changing every few hours. This is because of the strict etiquette of the time, which dictated that certain dresses were for certain activities, which meant you had to plan your errands around your outfit changes that made it possible for you to run your errands. Isn't that fun? Women would start with the morning time dress, which was relatively comfortable by Victorian standards. However, for us, it would still feel like wearing an iron reinforced tube sock on our entire body. It was simpler in appearance and designed for only the home. Want to take a stroll in the park? Out of the morning dress and into the walking dress. The skirts are shorter by several inches and didn't have a train, so they weren't dragging a leaf pile behind them as they went. The materials were usually rich in color and patterned to be admired amongst the greenery. When women returned home from their daily walk, they would change in dress number three, or the afternoon dress for receiving visitors or visiting others. The skirts had a longer train and the neckline was usually a little lower. After some visiting time, dress number four gets whipped out for dinner and it was the most formal of all casual dresses. Usually silk, satins, velvets, exactly the type of precious material you want to spill food on. Ball gowns weren't for regular wear, but they were required for fancy occasions so you had to own them too. Number seven, calf ear appetizers. This one goes out to all the folks who like their steak well done, as this may be too much to stomach. Given the way food was prepped and handled back then, I would agree with most folks that cooking the devil out of your meat was probably just the safer bet. Sucks for me because I like my steak rare, as rare as you can make it. Blue, almost, honestly. I, I love it like that. I am also willing to bet that most of you folks who like your steak well done aren't a big fan of fat and gristle. <laughs> I also love fat and grizzle. I just like meat, what can I say? What I'm getting to is calf ear appetizers. Yes, cooked calf ears, which I'm pretty sure are just like pure cartilage. Higher class women could often find themselves at parties where they would serve up this chewy delight. You'd probably just be chewing on that for a while. I feel like most people wouldn't like that. Is Chris a cartilage guy? I don't know, we'll see. Number six, hand cleavage. This goes for every inch of the skin, really, but women had to cover up back then. That means no ankles, neck, or God forbid a wrist. If a man saw a wrist, they would act, uh, ooh. Well, I don't know if they were that down bad, but women of higher esteem wore gloves. There's, there's etiquette to gloves. It was all part of the, the culture, which means only women with dosh could practice such glove etiquette. I say no woman should have the cover up. She should wear whatever the heck she wants when the heck she wants to. However, with the gloves, I believe there's a separate issue. I have an issue being a big dude with asthma. I sweat a lot more than the average folk. It just sucks, but if I was a fair lady with those gloves on, well, I might want to leave them on. Wouldn't want to ruin anyone's appetites for calf ear appetizers because the smell and the sweat, it just, ooh, be gross, ooh. Number five, dress is too big. This is something I'm glad isn't a thing anymore. I, I'm not a person who likes to dress up. I'm a simple dude. Casual and comfortable is my forte. However, uncomfortable wearing suits is. I like to think I clean up well. And I understand sometimes you gotta wear drip. It's just how life goes. Sometimes you gotta dress up. I just don't think people should be showing up to any formal events in cowboy boots and a pop collar shirt. I've known a few of those people. But what I'm really talking about here is the obtuse size of women's dresses and just the whole culture of women's fashion back then. It's just crazy. Large and overbearing dresses with enough material to use as blankets when you sleep. I know that couldn't have been fun. It just, it's horrible. Especially with my sweat problem. A few hours in a suit and maybe a few beers later and the first thing I'm trying to do is take the suit off. It gets tight and sweaty in there and it's just a lot of material. It's just, it's just too much. Too much. And doorways, trying to get through doorways. Ugh. Forget about it. Number four, fava beans. Well, after all that sweating and being around all that foulness, ladies needed to detox. How about a nice face mask made of beef? Yes, that's right. To keep their skin young and beautiful, they would drape a slice of beef over their face. Nothing like a little Hannibal Lecter before bedtime. Now, I hear you saying, well, Chad, that's not that bad. Okay, but think about this though. For the time period, that beef was probably yucky due to food processing practices of the time. And, and, and there's just no fridges. That means it was stinky. I hope it was at least winter before these ladies decided to beef up like that. This process of beef was supposed to rejuvenate the skin because beef contains some important vitamins for such. I just, I can't recommend that. You just walk in with the beef and, hello, darling, yes. Ugh, gross. 
Number three, hot Christmas. This is just so dumb. I'm just gonna go ahead and tell everyone at home right now not to do this, because I know some of you, and some of you are gonna be like, oh, thanks, Chetty, that's cool. No, don't do it. I'm a doctor, a lawyer, and a firefighter. Basically, this was a super fun game that felt like something out of Johnny Knoxville's head, not Victorian families gathering at Christmas. Basically, they would gather at Christmas to play a game called Snapdragon. You get a bowl of raisins and almonds, you pour some brandy in there, and maybe one out for your homie, and ignite the brandy. Once the bowl is on fire, the family will compete to see who can grab the flaming treats and eat them the fastest. Okay, second degree burns are not how I want to spend my holiday season, and also, in a time before smoke alarms and a modern fire service, this sounds like a really bad time. Grandpa could lose it out of his hands. Drapes catch fire, the house burns down, probably the whole neighborhood. Just a bad idea. Also, I hate raisins, so setting them on fire? Yeah, I'm out. I don't like raisins. They're gross, dude. I don't like them. Number two, Crypt Picks. Look, it's a part of life. It happens. You live, you love, and depending on how much your wife likes interior design, you probably have a sign hanging up like that in your home somewhere that says something like that. You know what I'm talking about. And after spending all that time in home sense, it's all over. Fade the black, cease to exist, the forever box. There's a whole process and respect in the undertaking business. The Victorian era had a strange tradition, however. How about taking photographs with the body of a family member who has recently passed on? Yeah, that's right, I know. I couldn't believe it, really. People would sit there for minutes taking photos of those who are no longer with us because the process of taking photos was not great. This isn't the digital age, after all. This is something that the Crypt Keeper would make you do. Keep, just, and, and keep them in the album or something. Just, just not, not for your everyday family, man. That's just weird. Yeah, so now we're going to take photos. <laughs> like, that's just weird, you know what I mean? It's just weird, it's weird. Number one, Jack the Ripper. Listen, the women of Victorian London feared this guy, and how can you blame them? A terror that seemed to come from nowhere and could strike from anywhere. Humans unaliving other humans is nothing new, and it probably won't be old, it won't get old soon. We, we're, this is what we do, it's kind of our thing. But this was the first modern serial unaliver. Jack the Ripper's identity has never been found. It's only been speculated, and some studies suggest that it has been revealed, but it's really hard to pinpoint something that happened that long ago. He was nasty, and the crimes were awful. The photographs of the crime scene do not exactly follow today's media rules or decency, as it's really just horrible, and it's just really messy and bloody and just gross. It's kind of hard to talk about this era without Jack the Ripper. Women should feel safe at night no matter what era it is. That's right, ladies, I'm on your side. Number 10, the Fuzzy Wonder. Growing up, I had the classic red toy car. It was great. I would honk the horn, slam the door with attitude, wearing a diaper. It was the perfect invention for a youngin' like me. But back in the Victorian era, the toys, or whatever, not as fun. Definitely not as fun. Fisher Price wasn't born yet, so if you wanted to wheel around and kill time, maybe even have a few laughs, well, you had to use this. The Fuzzy Wonder. Yeah, this, uh, let's unpack this one, shall we? This patent, I'll be honest, this patent here makes me think. It makes me wonder more than anything. Why didn't this change history? Are you kidding me? The fuzzy seat, the gears, the foot straps, the possibilities are endless with the Fuzzy Wonder. The only thing that we do know about this patent, the only hint as to who or what this was for is written right below the product's name. It says, the Fuzzy Wonder, the champion of his species. His species? You're telling me there's more of these? Where's the fuzzy champion? Let's take him for a spin. He's probably got an engine. It's probably great. I go shopping riding one of these for sure. Definitely wheeling around, throwing stuff in. Easy. Number nine, top hat cigar holders. Yeah, this one here is so Victorian. I love it. In the Victorian era, smoking cigars was a popular pastime amongst wealthy men. If you were rich, you had to smoke cigars all day, every day, and then cough nonstop. Cigar holders, of course, were used to prevent the cigar smoke from directly entering the smoker's mouth and to keep the cigar cool and on your persons. There were various types of cigar holders during the Victorian era, ranging from simple wooden or metal tubes to more elaborate designs made of ivory, silver, or sometimes gold, fancy schmancy. Some holders were designed to be attached at the end of a walking stick, while others could be worn as a pendant on a chain, or in this case, for some reason, a top hat. Yeah, why is there smoke coming from that man's head? I wonder if he's okay. Oh, he's just bad. That's cool, my mistake, sir. Continue on with your Victorian cigar stroll. Yeah, people's heads were smoking. They would keep all of them lit on their top hat. What a weird place to hold them. Cigar holders were often personalized with the owner's initials or family crest, and they were considered a status symbol. 
although it looked ridiculous on a top hat. This was a way to flex your wealth, you know what I mean? There were no broke boys walking around with top hats, no way. Or cigar holders on said top hats. No way, that's insane. That's a lot of weight on a hat. I'd be, I'd be doing this a lot. Number eight, the fork and knife cleaner. In theory, in the Victorian era, this one sounds great, but it also seems like way more effort than just hand washing, you know? I don't know, let's talk about it. Invented in 1850 by Thomas Parker in Kensington, the knife and fork cleaner in the 1850s, it was pretty significant. It was a big improvement in the process of cleaning cutlery, a bit, I guess. Prior to this invention, cleaning knives and forks was a time consuming and often challenging task. Definitely harder than it is today to wash a dish. The knife and fork cleaner consisted of a handheld device with multiple bristles and brushes and gears that would all fit around the knife or the fork and then it would spin and move around. Again, looks like a saw trap. The user would then rub the utensil back and forth through the bristles to remove any food or debris. It took a while and like I'm saying, a little bit more effort probably. This invention was particularly used for commercial kitchens where large quantities of cutlery needed to be cleaned quickly, so restaurants, whatever. It was also popular among households, even though it didn't last too long. It's definitely worth a mention. It looks scary more than anything. I wouldn't be like, ugh, cleaning my fork, like don't eat my arm, thank you. Arsenic, like plasters, was a cure-all, and it's number seven in the countdown. If you've seen our other video, top 10 unusual fashion trends from the Victorian era, you might know that arsenic was in everything in the Victorian era. Makeup, wallpaper, dye. No exception was made in medicine either as arsenic was prescribed for anything from anemia in Merrick's diagnosis manual to anthrax, cancer, reduced libido, syphilis, or even cholera. While it was most popular to consume arsenic, it could also be inhaled or injected. Being a byproduct of smelting, it's no wonder arsenic was everywhere during the industrial revolution as there was an excess of it. So it was incredibly accessible and a household remedy. Since doctors already prescribed it to do so much, everyday people just start to use it to treat any common ailment. Unsurprisingly, many people suffered arsenic poisoning symptoms. The ailments are now referred to as Fowler's disease. Number six is all kinds of gross and questionable. The everlasting pill. When the Merck Manual was first published, part of the comprehensive treatment plan for an eruptive fever, which is a classification for diseases like scarlet fever, smallpox, and chickenpox, was actually laxatives. Castor oil was the main laxative choice for Victorians up until the debut of the everlasting pill, made up of a metal now known to be toxic called antimony, would be invented. Swallowing this would induce severe vomiting and diarrhea, thus giving the body what they thought to be a healthy cleanse, and their intention was to purge diseases from the body. It earned the name the everlasting pill, as the pill would pass through the gastric system mostly intact, meaning it could be retrieved and cleaned for future use. Seeing as the metal was greatly valuable at the time, it was quite common to keep it in the family and hand it down generation to generation. Imagine getting that in your granny's will. Watch out, it may shock ya. Number five is shock treatment. When profit can be made off of insecurity, unsavory business flourishes. Victorians honed in on the man's moral weaknesses as a cause for erectile dysfunction, and impotence was thought to be caused by either too much sex and masturbation or not enough. So doctors took a few shocking routes, literally, such as galvantic baths or bathtubs filled with electrodes, which were supposed to restore sexual desire in an advertised six sessions. For a more direct approach, a thin rod with running electric current could be placed up into a man's Repeat that twice a week, about five minutes each time, and your little man should be ready to rumble. By the late 1800s, ads were running for electric belts aimed at weak men. They claimed to help cure kidney pain and sciatic nerve issues and back aches and headaches and nervous exhaustion, and of course, mainly their dysfunction. While today impotence is recognized as the result of physical or mental duress, age, or genetics, the belief that electric shock therapy is a useful cure for impotence still persists, and some studies have shown positive signs. See that, fellas? Don't knock it till you Try it. Speaking of electrocuting genitals, you can't tell me that didn't happen at least once with the first electric vibrators, which is number four in our countdown. Female hysteria became a diagnosable medical condition way back in medieval times when the concept of a wandering uterus, when a discontented or displaced uterus would cause a woman ill health, was first coined. Believed to have symptoms such as irritability, insomnia, fainting, anxiety, menstruation, or horniness, pretty much every woman showed these symptoms. Hysteria was 
pretty common. Doctors cure hysterical paroxysm and orgasm. For hundreds of years leading up to this invention, doctors were manually administering pelvic massages to women to achieve the necessary cure. But all that wrist work added up over time and doctors needed a break. So cue Dr. Joseph Mortimer Granville, he created an electric steam powered electromechanical medical instrument, nicknamed the manipulator. The device allowed women to give themselves home massages to cure their wandering wombs and giving doctors the well deserved break they needed. A questionable cure for a very questionable diagnosis. Number 3 is not for the faint of heart. They loved leeches. It may be crazy to imagine, but between the late 1700s and well into the early 1900s, there was a booming leech trade all across Europe. Leeches were shipped from Germany to America by the tens of thousands. England even had to start importing them from France by the mid 1800s as their own leech stocks were not even enough to supply their own doctors. Francis Bressoyas believed that all diseases resulted from the excess buildup of blood and documented this belief in a medical journal that would subsequently cause leeches to become the go to treatment in France and then later spread across Europe. This usage of leeches then became worldwide from there and so obscene that the creatures started to go extinct. However, what these quacks didn't know is that bloodletting was very, very, very rarely beneficial to any conditions and applying leeches often resulted in detrimental side effects such as blood loss, diarrhea and vomiting or those with poor immune systems could even be exposed to hazardous bacteria and infection, let alone death from hemorrhagic shock for literally anyone they did this to. Eventually the excessive use of leeches meant that they became too expensive to ship, too scarce due to the over farming to find and medically obsolete in the face of new science that questioned the medical merits of bloodletting. Thank God. Number 2 doesn't allow you to touch where number 1 usually comes out. It's the masturbatory mental illness. Obviously it's natural, normal and well fun, but the Victorian perspective of masturbation was nowhere near what it is today. As our old timely friends saw it as a serious threat to mental and physical health or even could kill you. Self love was seen as an ultimate evil, but beyond moralistic arguments many physicians thought that every orgasm drained a man's energy. Married men were warned by doctors to limit the amount of sex they were having, while unmarried men were encouraged and urged to conserve their essence by avoiding sex altogether, particularly masturbation. Even wet dreams and uncontrolled ejaculation were considered a sexual dysfunction, as masturbation essentially became the male version of hysteria. So how did you treat this condition? Men had to stop masturbating. Fear and shame campaigns did what they do best and stimulated the market to provide quick quack remedies. They came in the form of anti-masturbation devices that looked like torture chambers. Most popular was the jugum, which was a metal ring attached around the base of a man's, you know, and then screwed on. If he was to become erect at any point, whether awake or asleep, the now inflated skin would make contact with sharp metal teeth that would dig in. Like I said, most popular. Consider how much worse these other options were for that to be the primo choice. A spermatic truss was essentially the first jock strap, but meant for every day. And the Bowden device fastened a little metal helmet to the end of a man's member that bound up into his pubic hair so that it would be ripped out should he become erect. I'm more than happy to keep going, but I'm sure more than enough people are wincing right now. Keep in mind, while these men were going through this to avoid masturbation, women were being prescribed it as a cure. Number one on our countdown may be a bit of a surprise. Surgery. How could surgery be a questionable treatment? Well, it itself isn't, but the men performing it and their hygiene towards surgery were. Most famous is Robert Liston. Said to be able to remove a leg in 30 seconds, he notoriously used his own mouth to hold scalpels, knives, and even once sucked the pus out of a woman's throat wound. According to medical historian Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris, surgeons never washed their instruments or their hands, and Victorian surgeons were known for wearing old surgery garments out of prowess, reportedly so stiff with old blood that they were nearly cardboard in appearance. Even the operating tables themselves were rarely washed down, and it was said a visitor to St. George's Hospital in London 1825 discovered mushrooms and maggots thriving in the damp, dirty sheets of a patient's bed. When asked why they hadn't complained, the patient assumed this to be the norm. And what about surgery in the moment? Well, the patients were conscious and undrugged as they were operated on, and surgeries needed to be fast as a result. One in four people died 
died after their surgery, whether it was still on the operating table or from infections afterwards. But what about our buddy I mentioned, Dr. Liston? Only one in ten of his patients died. This was because of his speed. Time me, gentlemen, time me, he'd shout to the surgery spectators to put his legendary speed to the test. Sure, he did accidentally castrate somebody once because of his wild motions, but nobody's perfect. In fact, while he's remembered for being the first surgeon to use anesthesia, wash his knives, and invent a still used medical tool, he is the only surgeon to ever have a 300% death rate. I'd be remiss not to mention that during a leg amputation, his lightning speed reportedly cut off three fingers of the assistant who had been holding down the patient. Then, as he brought the knife back up, he slashed the coat of a spectator. The spectator reportedly died immediately of fright, likely a heart attack. Though the assistant and patient survived initially, like most who were treated in Victorian hospitals, they died not long after from infection, which was also just called hospitalism at the time because of how many people died that way. It's easy to say that going to a Victorian surgery or a hospital may have been as efficient as rubbing dirt into a wound. Number 10 is chloroform the hiccups away. Nowadays we know a nasty case of hiccups is curable by just holding your breath or chugging a bunch of water. But if this was 1899, you'd be prescribed chloroform. Known by many as the mysterious liquid on the rag placed over the someone's face to make them faint in many period pieces or cartoons, chloroform gained popularity after Queen Victoria demanded its usage during her labor in 1853, after having been denied it in her previous labors. By taking these lengths to reduce the annoyance of hiccups, your vital organs may pay a steep price. Chloroform has the potential to damage the nervous system, lungs, and trachea, as well as the liver and kidney when exposed long term. This is just one of many medical remedies that we'll be covering from the first Merrick Manual of Diagnosis and Therapy, the oldest continuously published English language medical textbook. All the quack treatments in our list today used to be found in this mass encyclopedia. For instance, number 9 in our countdown is smoke inhalation for asthma and other lung conditions. This may be one of the more counterintuitive remedies on our list, as it's easy to see now that smoke is not beneficial for asthma at all. Through the late 19th and into the next, however, inhaling smoke or smoke, as well as stramonium, a hallucination inducing nightshade, as well as lobelia, known for its sedative properties, were popular treatments for asthmatics. Asthma is caused when your airways can narrow or swell while producing excess mucus. Smoking meanwhile has been shown to eventually reduce the number of cilia, the lungs filaments which help transport mucus into the lungs, which only leads to the worsening of asthma symptoms. This wasn't the only weird tobacco smoke belief however, in 1872 an English newspaper talked of tobacco smoke enemas which even reported that hundreds of lives might have been spared by the tobacco smoke enema. Okay. Weird enough. Plasters, no not the British word for band-aids, is number 8. This medical treatment was said to have sucked the badness out of a person. They were like a nicotine patch made up of a thin layer sheet of wax as well as leather and it was able to stick onto the skin. In the wax there were remedies such as lead, opium, frankincense, tobacco, etc. This mix would be applied while still warm to ensure the adhesion of the plaster. Plasters were sold to anyone of any age and came in many different shapes and sizes so that they may be applied to different areas. Areas. What were they used for? Everything. Cough, cold, period pain, organ failure, alcoholism, headache, the list can go on forever. Seeing as they wanted the patch to pull as much badness from the body as possible, these patches could be left on for two days to two weeks to forever. Without washing, of course. Naturally, these patches trapped in a lot of moisture that could cause infections, blisters, rashes, and hives underneath, especially once the patch is removed and the skin is finally exposed to air. Rule number seven is to mourn properly. Another dress all women owned was an all black morning dress. They kept these bad boys on lock for whenever someone died, which was arguably something to look forward to in the Victorian era. Thanks to Victoria being the most extraordinary and dramatic woman of all time when her husband Prince Albert died in 1861, and she spent a bajillion years dressing like a vampire and wearing black mantillas, it set this bizarre fashion and mourning standard that metamorphosized into literal rules. If one was to ignore these rules, it was seen as incredibly offensive to the deceased. Self help books dedicated to making men and women better at exerting dramatic woe were pretty common to see on bookstore shelves. So a mourning rule for women was should her husband die, the widow was expected to mourn for no less than two years, while mourning for parents and offspring only lasted a year. Relatives such as grandparents and siblings would only get six months. They dole it out like family inheritance is a little weird. Queen Victoria had favored black crepe and it became one of the only fabrics that was permissible for mourning clothing. Luxurious silks and satins weren't permissible, only itchy and abrasive materials materials that chafed the sadness right into you. Women would often wear merino or cashmere instead. No jewelry or ornamentation was permitted unless it served a functional purpose like a button or a clasp. 
or unless it was a bunch of the deceased's hair and teeth braided in a pattern together in the jewelry. Don't forget your big black hat and grandma's doily tablecloth you dyed black to throw over your face and body. You're looking like a corpse for two years. Rule number six is to glove up. We love to joke about the whole, oh no, if you show your ankle, you're a Victorian W word. But weirdly, hands were actually way more of an issue. The ankle thing was just because men were still trying to look up women's skirts, even when they were so long, the ends of them entered a room 15 minutes after the wearer did. Fingers were actually oh, the gasp worthy thing of the day. It was considered highly inappropriate to walk in public spaces with uncovered hands and would draw a lot of ill repute to those daring damsels who did. In fact, women's hands were so scandalous, both written and unwritten rules of Victorian etiquette unanimously agreed that if a man and a woman happened to be walking on an unevenly surfaced road, it was the one and only time that he could take her hand if they were unwed. Funny that the only permissible contact between the couple the yet to be engaged is to prevent her needing to be picked up from a Victorian pile of mud sludge. It does not matter where you are headed outside of your home, you must wear gloves, which weren't just a popular fashion accessory, but as stated, social necessity. Like every other item a woman could wear in this era, there were many kinds of gloves based on the occasion. For example, daytime was for short gloves, which usually bore designs, embellishments, whereas in the evening, gloves had feathers, satin ribbons, and other super flammable decorations. Rule number five is the modest dip. Because we're on the topic of acceptable fashions and modesty, a Victorian woman taking a dip at the beach pretty much looked the same as four burly men sitting in an ice fishing hut in Alaska. First of all, this was something only middle and upper middle class people could really do as it required money. You had to rent bathing machines, which looked like outhouses on wheels, but were really covered carriages that drove through the shallow water of the beach. There was a hole in the bottom that the ladies could stick their legs into or sometimes submerge their whole body, but that was ill-advised, not because the water was filthy, which it was, and riddled with corpses and poison to boot, but because creeps could come swimming up and see your bare legs. Can't afford the traveling outhouse? Well, no beach for you. Rule number four is wife sales, a real legal way to obtain a divorce in stuffy Christianized England. Divorce was unpopular, detested, and openly deterred in those days. Seeing as you were discouraged from intercourse with your partner, married them when you barely knew them, and could barely spend time alone with one another, it was a pretty popular request. You would have to sit listening to the clock tick and his nose being clogged but him not blowing it for the 444th night in a row while you disassociate staring into a fireplace. What the hell did people expect, of course you want out. You don't even know his middle name. Attaining a divorce in the early 1900s was an expensive undertaking, however. So, those who couldn't afford the legal fees sometimes sold their wives to the highest bidder. It was often done with the full consent of the wife, who was usually bought by her family, a new lover, or a female friend. It was an amicable way to say, this was a mistake, get out of my house, good luck and prosper. Rule number three is no flirting. As stated, you were really not supposed to flirt, and flirting to the Victorians included eye contact, talking to one another, looking at another person, breathing their air, knowing their name. Maybe the last one is dramatic, but you get my point. You wanted someone, you had to wait until you met them four or five times, then you could look at them, run into them a couple more times, then maybe request a dance at a ball, and you get one of those a couple times, then maybe you get a sit down chaperone visit, maybe a walk in the park, and a couple more ball dances. Then you can propose. But even then, a Victorian maiden could not be trusted alone with her fiance, lest her dainty, fluttering hand rest on the arm of her intent and cause an outburst that would inflame the fiance's uncontrollable base lusts. Even after progressing through several stages of acceptable dating, aka the ball dancing, talking, walking together at a distance, if a man was invited to the woman's home, their acquaintanceship would still have to be under the watchful eye of a chaperone. Single women were never to indulge in behavior with a man that might lead to being kissed or handled in any way. This included strict inspection rules, because I kid you not, men were encouraged to inspect a woman back then. Like many of the stipulations that accompany shipping procedures. How romantic. If a man wanted to admire a necklace, the woman would have to remove it, hand it over for inspection. Under no circumstances was the item to be inspected while she wore it. Now I know where that flirting tactic came from because guys, y'all love that whole jewelry admiring flirt and it isn't subtle. And of course, during the chance encounters in one's club or in the park, staring boldly at someone you knew without acknowledging him or her, known as cutting, was the ultimate display of bad flirting manners in Victorian times. Guess they didn't like them bold back then. Rule number two is coming out. Not like that. Coming out in Victorian times meant a woman was tired of being in her parents' house, and if she wanted out of it, it meant she had to go find a semi-tolerable guy whose house she could move into in return for a cool ring on her left hand. This had to be a whole big announcement because to attend such events that a woman needed to to meet a potential suitor, she required the explicit permission of her mother. Only after stating her intent could 
of the chaperones be organized because she can't go alone. Think of Bridgerton. Rich families might accompany the announcement with a series of parties or even a royal visit. Middle class families might hold a celebratory feast. Lower class families might not formally celebrate the announcement at all. Instead, the young woman just changed her appearance to show availability. This could be putting up her hair, donning a long dress, and accompanying family members to social events like church service, church dinners, festival balls. Coming out was best done during the in season, a literal term. It meant the four months from April to July where the upper class families up and down the country would send their teenage daughters to London. After flocking there en masse, the upper classes would congregate a series of balls and dances for the purpose of meeting, matching, and reproducing the next generations. At these events, the race was on to find someone with whom to make love. Again, this phrase of which whose meaning has changed considerably over time. Making love in the Victorian age meant seeking out someone who might one day come to love you. This was done by eligible bachelors going up to girls' chaperones, giving them a little card, requesting a dance with her. Her dance cards would be stacked in queue order in which the men got their dances and they were only allowed three per woman. End of the night rolls around and our maiden will choose if she liked a suitor and have her chaperone return the card to indicate, oh yeah buddy, it's on. Rule number one is how to travel, aka how not to have fun. Here's your duties when you're traveling as a Victorian lady. Listen up, take notes, dress appropriately. This is usually a dress similar to the morning gown, lighter and easier to move around in, but most importantly, plain and understated with few details. They would accessorize with dark leather gloves, straw bonnet, and of course, a travel corset, which was apparently said to be much less restrictive. Pick your seat carefully. It was customary for a woman traveling alone to choose a seat either next to another woman or an elderly gentleman. Women traveling alone were seen as prime targets for pickpocketers and thieves. It was usually only done to poor women without chaperone options, but all women, rich or poor, were instructed to keep only a small amount of customary spending cash on their person and give the bulk of their dough to their driver or escort to keep safe. Speak when spoken to, as only men were allowed to spark conversation with a lady, never the opposite way around. Women were expected to respond politely and accept invitations to the refreshment saloon, even if they didn't want to go. That's because of the next rule. Never ever be rude while traveling, especially alone. It was imperative a woman act with the utmost class, even if being accosted by a persistent male passenger. But make sure you don't pester him. If a woman is traveling with a male companion, it's not appropriate to ask him such questions as, when do we get there? How far is it? You know you're making the wrong turn. Yes, you are. I know you are. I've been this way before. Look, that was the wrong way. How much time do you think that wrong turn added? Do you want to stop and grab something too? Yeah, no, strictly forbidden. Can't do that crap. But don't forget, you're also a babysitter to the because if the lady's male chaperone accidentally wandered into designated female compartments, it was her fault for either inviting him into the quarters or not alerting him of the specialized area. And lastly, while traveling, don't check yourself in. If a journey requires a stop at a hotel along the way, the lady would remain in the carriage while the driver or escort took care of all the room arrangements, likely because it was unheard of for a woman to make such a decision on her own. Number 10, bottomless undies. I think I speak for everyone when I say that putting on a clean, fresh pair of underwear is a nice feeling. Gone is the brown underwear that was once white of yesterday, replaced with fresh, loving linen of today. Now, if you're also like me, then you probably have some underwear with holes in it. I'll throw them out eventually, I'll, I'll get around to it, just wear them a few more times first and then I'll get rid of them. But did you know that some ladies underwear in the Victorian era had no bottoms? Yeah. Part of the many layers of clothing that women were wearing back then, their underwear had no bottoms. Which to me is the whole point of wearing bloomers in the first place. You gotta keep your business warm and packed away. I just don't understand what the point of having it all hang out is. That's just, that's just stupid. I don't know. Number 9. No razors. There's a joke about the 70s George W. Bush and garden hedges here, but I'm gonna let you fill in the blanks. Basically, this is a time in history where you cannot hop in the whip and drive on over to your local hair razor dealership because there ain't no whips and there ain't no CVS or Shoppers Drug Mart if you're Canadian. Today, you can buy disposable razors pretty much anywhere and there's multiple models for doing so. When things get hairy, you got options. Women in the Victorian era were not so lucky. They had to go for the natural look. Now, not that there's anything wrong with that, it's just I feel like a girl's gotta have her options. She gotta be able to, you know, do her own thing. Why not? Number eight, the Dirty Thames. When you think of Victorian England and the people, there's only really two classes, the wealthy and the ones who are broke and sound like they're from Peaky Blinders, love. Yeah, that's right. However, even for women of high esteem with their bottomless undies and lady mains growing a flush, the streets of Victorian London weren't very bourgeois, to say the least. Muddy dirt roads, thieves, beggars, and a really bad smell. It just didn't smell very nice. 
Oh, and also a really scary guy, but we'll get to that in part one. But perhaps the most disgusting was the Thames River, which after years of treating it the same way Brendan Fraser was treated after the Mummy franchise was over, it wasn't a good look. It was full of filth, sewage, garbage, and animal cadavers. So much so that it was said you could walk across the river on top of them. That is no place for a lady to be. Oof. Number seven, Vigor's horse action saddle. All right, now we're into it, here we go. I mentioned the fuzzy wonder earlier. This thing here, Vigor's horse action saddle. Yeah, action saddle, We've got some action here. There we go. This saddle would sit somewhere in your home, ideally in a place where no one else could see you. That's great, that's a start. The way they marketed this thing back then, they made it sound like it was an actual health benefit riding this <laughs> big vibrator, for lack of a better term. That's all it did, it would just vibrated and you sat on it. That's all I'll say, that's all I'm allowed to say. On the patent, it states that Vigor's horse action saddle can promote good spirits, it quickens circulation, it stimulates the liver, and probably other places, and it even creates an appetite. Yeah, all that and a thing that shakes you up in the corner of your house. Imagine it's the Victorian era and you have to watch your drunk uncles take turns riding this thing all weekend long. This is far too intimate for the family room. This is kind of gross. Yeah, it vibrates a lot and really hard. So that's it, you can do the rest. You can think the rest of the thoughts, dirty freaks. Number six, the toilet mask. Madame Rowley's toilet mask. Okay, where do I even begin with this one? At first, I thought that this was a mask that you had to wear while you took a shit. I mean, compared to everything else on this list, I was like, yeah, sure. People would wear the Phantom of the Opera masks every time they had to go to the washroom. Probably, who knows, they were weird back then. A toilet mask was not that, I mean, not too far from that. The toilet mask was a natural beautifier for bleaching and preserving your skin. <laughs> Victorian bleach, <laughs> easy, that's fun. The patent even stated that this mask would remove complexion imperfections. Complexion imperfections, see you later. Huh, what a treat, how lucky are we? All you have to do is wear this mask three times a week. For how long? I don't know, doesn't say. Just feel it out, I guess. Just feel out the bleach. Turns out lead cosmetics pasted onto a mask and bleach. Turns out it was not beneficial for your health at all. Who knew? Not me. Ah, uh, yes, let me put on my bleach mask before, well, I can't breathe or see anymore. Never mind, I'm gonna stop wearing that. Number five. Automatic smoking machines. When I read about this, I actually laughed my ass off for like a minute straight. I get some of these inventions or where these inventions were trying to go. Like an indoor saddle, sure, that's fun, I guess, if you want it to be. The mask at the time was thought to have beauty benefits. The automatic smoking machine was all bad. I don't see any good thing about this thing. It's not even designed well, it looks like shit in the corner. It was just a machine that smoked all of your cigarettes. Yeah, it smoked them automatically and then blew the smoke all over your curtains. What a great invention. Nice, 10 out of 10. Gonna review that. What a perfect addition to the family. This thing, first of all, was not small. It was not petite. It looked like a saw trap placed in the corner. It was so Victorian and scary looking. There's gears and pulleys and they're like, there's smoke pluming out of random places. It's like having a choo-choo train in your house. Who wants this? A choo-choo train that gave you lung cancer. Nice, score. Merry Christmas. Yeah, fire it up. It only takes 80 cigarettes at a time. I know. Number four, the surprise chair. Are you tired of sitting down on chairs that, you know, stay still and don't immediately topple back once you apply any amount of pressure? Well, don't I have just the thing for you? Here we go. The surprise Victorian chair. I guess it was invented for laughs in a world before Netflix. Sure, I guess. You have to be creative. There's no sign of practicality in this patent, so we're gonna go ahead and assume that these 1800s folks, they were hilarious. They loved a practical gag. I'm not even gonna say prank. Don't even make me say prank, YouTube. Not saying the P word. The patent shows the exact science here and what it takes to surprise your guest and then have them topple to the ground. I go, ah, ha, ha, and then you bring them back up and then give them the real chair. This is a prank gift, and if we've learned anything in time, getting prank gifts, it only works once. So once you get your pal to take a topple in the 1800s, you would then have to store this heavy, antique, horrible looking heavy chair somewhere in your home and then bring the real chair back. Again, it sounds like way too much effort for a very low payoff. Imagine that, 400 pound chair. They're like, yeah, gotcha. All right, who next? Number three, toilet troubles. Now the Victorian era, it was, it was unsanitary to say the least, sure. But it was also dangerous in ways that you wouldn't expect. Some random poo-poo signs coming out of you. One of the greatest Victorian inventions was the bathroom. I love this one, it's great. Now, it took a few tries to figure out the whole methane gas problem, but we did it. Yeah, spontaneous combustion of the bathroom was weirdly common in the V era. Flammable gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide, well, they build up over time with human waste. More human waste than just, well, so much shit 
and gases. It built up into sewers and eventually it backed up into our homes. Next thing you know, you're lighting a candle and then your bathroom's gone and you're gone and there's shit everywhere and it's the Victorian era and you're like, what do I even do right now? What just happened? What science was that? Number two, the wave rock and bath. Seaside at home, let's do it. Are you tired of regular bathtubs that are stationary, relaxing and don't soak your entire floor in minutes? Well, the Niagara wave rock and bath washes all that away. Yep, see you later. This bathtub was designed to rock, literally. It kept your blood in active circulation, apparently, and it only required three pails of water. Also a bull. The patent promised the fullest illusion of a sea or a river bath, whilst promising absolutely no water will splash on the floor. Yeah, good joke, no way that's gonna happen. And it didn't happen because that's way too good to work out. Imagine having this now growing up, are you kidding me? My mom would be yelling at me to clean up the floor immediately. I already made enough splashes with just a stationary bathtub. I don't want a, a rocking bathtub. I'm trying to rinse my hair, I'm like, this sucks. Everywhere. It's so stupid. Just doing this is so stupid. Looking at lights. Finally, number one, beauty patches. Oh, we need to bring back beauty patches ASAP. Imagine me right now doing this list with an 800s beauty patch. You'd hit that thumbs up immediately. You'd be like, this Victorian man is straight out of time. These patches came in all shapes and sizes. Now, even in this portrait from 1755, quite a ways ago, Joshua Reynolds painted Charles, the ninth Lord Carthart, rocking a large beauty patch. These beauty patches go way back. Also, look at him. That's a Lord right there with that He's confident, got one of those, he's great. Beauty patches in the 1800s, they were small, tiny circles, sometimes even hearts or stars, which is, that's pretty fun, you go. Now the reason for these patches, and sometimes having more than one, is because they were commonly used to cover up smallpox scars. Yeah, we found out your secret, you Victorian era gentlemen. They were made out of silk velvet and they were applied with glue, so if you pick a spot, you better be confident. The patches were dark black and they were also meant to make your pale skin pop, which again, imagine if I had one right now, you'd be blind. I'm so pale as is already. If I put one of those patches on, I wouldn't be able to see the screen. You turn that brightness down real quick. The position of these patches could also determine your political allegiance. Historian Joseph Addison took note of these positions when observing two political parties from back in the 1800s. One party had beauty patches on the right side of their face, while the other side had the opposite. Today we have uh, Twitter. Yeah, usually you can tell someone's political allegiance by just taking a glimpse of that. You're like, oh dear, no, that's, we don't want to talk to that guy. He's a, he's a right patch kind of guy. Yeah.